you watch WCW in the 80s, then my guest is no stranger and needs no introduction. If you didn't, and this is an uh, educational experience for you, maybe an assignment by your wrestling school that you're paying a lot of money to, this is J.J. Dillon and his efforts as uh, an on-camera talent and a worker behind the scenes, but an on-camera talent in the 80s leading the charge as the Four Horsemen tore literally through uh, WCW and Crockett's territory uh, was felt and admired by any wrestling fan that loved to jeer their favorite heels. You were one of them. Thank you for those moments. It's quite all right. Just as a, as a general statement, I mean, 88 was a very, very pivotal year, and certainly the, the pinnacle of my career was uh, as the leader of the Four Horsemen, something that just was a spontaneous thing that came together and had like a three-year run, and, and you know when anything begins, you have no idea how successful it's going to be, what the, the length of the reign is going to be, but in the year 1988, it really, really, wound down and as the year went on as we discussed you know different dates and different things that took place it became apparent that uh, maybe the the end was uh, a lot nearer than than we thought it would be at, mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning but on january 1st with Oli coming back um, some of the things in the business in in terms of uh, booking uh cross things that are kind of creatively made up and and sometimes uh, woven with with things that uh, involve real life, mm. Oli's son, which was the, the the basis of the story when he first broke away, uh, was in his senior year as an amateur wrestler, and you know towards the end of Oli's career, he thought it was important that he have that time with his son. So we use that as a storyline of hey, you know Oli, uh, you know the horseman is everything. And what do you mean your your, your son? It was, there is no choice, and, and of course that made that split easy. And Ole was away, but Ole drew a lot of money through his entire career. It didn't matter what side of the ring he was on or who his uh, uh, partners were or who his opponents were because basically his style never changed. So Ole really was away with the thing with his son, and um, now was the time to come back. And after the split with Luger, uh, it, it was a natural thing because Luger, even with the experience with the horseman, still was uh, relatively inexperienced in terms of length of time in the business. So having him and Ole together for however many matches was a good thing because it was kind of a safety net for, for Luger and you knew with Ole what you had, you were going to draw money. Did he enjoy being a babyface? I can't. I can't imagine that having been the case. I think in Ole's mind, he never thought of himself that way. As I, I just said, his style never changed. You got the same thing. And he was smart enough to know, I, I don't even know what, what was different about his presentation, whether the fans were cheering for him or booing for him. Uh, if, if there was any change, I'm sure it was very, very subtle. And uh, you know, it was the same Ole. <laughs> Not good, <laughs> um, you know. In, in our laws in the United States, you're you're innocent until uh, proven guilty. But when the list of what he had in his possession gets that long, it's like the possibility of coming up with a plausible explanation <laughs> becomes much, much more difficult. It's tough to pull a medical oh. license out of your ass yeah. uh, and justify it or a, Or a book of prescriptions. Oh, <laughs> I, I just happen to have you know a script from Dr. So-and-so for this. Are there any actions taken against him by the company upon hearing of the news? He is released on bail, so he's out. Yeah. Uh, in that era, it certainly was a, a, a black eye to the to the profession in general, which nobody wants that. And a lot of times, uh, the, the publicity stays 
it may have been a big deal uh, w near the border crossing. I think he came across to Detroit. Mm -hmm. So oh, it was a, probably a big deal there. And some other people are going to pick up on it, but uh, uh, you, it's one of those things that you just you hope uh, goes away and that somebody doesn't pick it up and, and use that as uh, something to wave a banner over a long-term right. long thing. Ronald Reagan in the White House. The Washington Redskins and Denver Broncos are headed to Super Bowl 22. The average American uh, household income, $27,225 a year. Um, and my guest was at that time, I would imagine making considerably more than $27,522 a year as one of the big uh, superstars in the World Wrestling Federation at the time. Jim Duggan, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Sean, but you know, straight oh. interview oh. or not, brother, I gotta oh. give it to him, kid. Because if you're going to be a wrestler, be a wrestler. So old Hacksaw's got to give up. Ho! Give me a hook, Sean. Ho! Ho! Kind of warms you up. You know, get you going, kid. One of the got to work on that hole. Five. <laughs>
I wanted to help Terry. I wanted Terry to be a success. One thing in, in our business was that you never missed a show. If there were problems beyond your control, and most of the time you tried to build in insurance, don't book them on the last flight. Don't do things that, um, that put you in the circumstances where a guy misses a show. But it's, that was not the first time that it's ever happened in the business, not the last time. But if, if you find that the guy wasn't there because of a personal decision that he made, that's a bad example. Bad example for, for the rest of the roster. And so you almost have to, to say something, do something. And uh, Michael was a great talent. But during this period of time, there was a, a, a much larger problem in that all of that talent that had worked for Bill Watts that were being assimilated into to WCW, it, it sounded like a, a great thing to all of a sudden greatly expand the roster. But to take that many top guys and all of a sudden just bring them in at one time, something like that takes a tremendous amount of planning. And in an ideal world, you would take this guy, give him a chance to have his moment in the sunshine and to, to put to position him in the right way and then this one. But you didn't have that luxury. Here's all this talent came. And the end result was a lot of guys, ah, uh, it just could have been handled better, but mm -hmm. the circumstances were, were what was really bad, and that was put a Michael lot of guys someone in who bed. was caught up caught up in that couldn't find the right spot for a big talent like him. I think that I think that had a lot to do with it. It was like a, a zoo around yeah. there, you know. We had we had Frankie and of course Matilda. And uh, one of my best friends back in the day, Jake the Snake Roberts, of course, had Damien. So I always used to rib with uh, Bobby and Vince. I said, you know, I'll carry anything. Mom doesn't eat or have to go to the bathroom. Because <laughs> it'd be like 20 below up in Boston on a January night, and you'd see one of the bull, uh, British Bulldogs out there walking. Matilda, take a dump, take a dump, damn it. So they used to handle the dog even Oh, they carried the dog with them, yeah, all the time. Of course, a dog would drink beer and uh, I'm sure he's got a few shots of steroids over the years and some downers that was barking too much you know it was the 80s and uh, they kind of abused the dog a little bit and, but it was only one dog where Jake actually went through a couple different snakes over the years. So Damien was many snakes? Oh yeah yeah one of my like I said Jake and I were, were very good friends you know and we were in Detroit one time and uh, there was a, another cold winter night and uh, we went out partying because Detroit had the best clubs. Uh, stay out all night, and I was in Chicago, but um, the landing strip and BTs, two strip joints, and there was an old joke about wrestlers and strippers, because you know, uh, strippers are usually wrestling fans, have good drugs, and are bisexual. Three things the guys were always looking for back in the day, you know? But, uh, so Jake and I, we went out, we partied pretty good, we came back to the hotel, we, we crashed the hotel, we woke up, and it was like, you know, about four or five inches of snow the next morning. We're like, oh, geez. We went and opened the trunk. There's my two by four. There's Damien, still frozen as stiff as a two by four. You can pick it up by its tail. <laughs> he left the snake in the trunk overnight. So uh, he had to call uh, the Vince and tell him that, uh, send me another snake, you know. Cause, uh, but actually, the, the pythons were, were quite uh, durable. You know, he went to the, uh, Cobras for a while when Mod did the deal with Macho Man and the, yes. the Cobra a bit Macho, and uh, the Cobras would die very easily. They were they weren't very durable snakes. Uh, Damien would would go through a lot of stuff because a lot of guys didn't like Jake, you know. And to get back on Jake, they would pick the bag up and drop it or put the boots to the snake and stuff. It was a I mean, it was a tough life for the snake actually, because uh, Jake uh, would have been my best man in my wedding, but my dad was my best man. So back in uh, the eighties, Jake and I were. were very, very tight, and we traveled together around a lot with that with the snake. Oh, the road stories! You went well, being tight with Jake in 1980. Oh, the road man. stories. You said uh, two inches of snow outside the room or inside no, the room? No, no, that was still the 80s. But <laughs> it's still the 80s. You know, I tell you a good story with Jake. We're driving down. We got the uh, Damon. He'd always kept in a, a bag, you know. Of course, the snake would always push against the bag. Always, always try to get out of the bag. So of course, we're late for some town, and we're. 
flying down some, you know, southeastern state highway. And I'm driving, and all of a sudden I look at my mirror, and there's, Jesus, there's Damien's head about that big looking over. And I was used to the snake because I traveled with him a lot. But still, you know, to be flying, I was, Jesus. It's like, Ugh! I hit the brakes, but you know, skidding into this little gas station. And of course, all the folks are sitting on the porch, and we bail out of the car, and they're like, Jake Snake Roberts, the hacksaw nugget. We go over the back seat, now we're fighting with Damien. Pull Damien out of the back seat, stuff him back in the bag, come throw him in the trunk, and drive off, you know. So to Jake, this day, the people are like, what the hell is going on there? So Jake would travel with the snake. He'd have to feed the snake, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, there was a guy named Albert that would, uh, wasn't a, you know, he would have uh, snakes that it would rotate. So I don't know if Jake actually fed the snake on the road. Uh, not that I have ever seen. I think he would send him back to Albert. Albert would feed him, send him another, another snake. But now they, everything's called uh, hardcore. But it was like a street fight right. battle royal. Right. Yeah. How'd you feel about battle royals? Some of the guys said they hated them. Just I enjoyed battle royals. <laughs> I had a lot of fun on them. Of course, you know, as things got, everything was taped and, and they kept a better eye. I'll tell you a good battle royal story. It was me, Kurt Henning, Boss Man, and Ultimate Warrior. You know, and the Warrior was kind of, you know, he's a big shot. You know, I'm the liar. You know, so I sat down before, you got knocked down, punk. But anyway. He wasn't the toughest guy in the world. But anyway, so the warrior, you know, he's got all these nylon, you know, uh, strings hanging off from you know. So me and Big Boss Man, I was over 300 pounds, of course, Boss was a big son of a gun. We pushed the warrior in the corner and we're working him over pretty good. And Boss Man throws his uh, warrior's arm over the rope and he hooks it, you know. So, But Kurt gets on the, on the mat, rolls underneath on the apron, he reaches up and he ties the nylon cord to the top <laughs> rope of the... <laughs> the ring, right? So me and boss man, boom, we break loose and warrior's like, boom! <laughs> Whoa, well, I break it. It's nylon. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> goes around his arm, now he's in there. Oh! <laughs> Chief J. Strongbow comes down with a knife. <laughs> cut him loose. Match. Third it's out. Yeah. He's tied up in the battle royal. So Kurt Boss and I got a, a free trip up to Stanford, Connecticut for that one, you know. <laughs> Talk to the big man a little bit. Well, but ribs were happening all the time, and you could, can't punish everybody. That ribs were, it was a, a diff, different business. Now, you know, this, with this last run with WWE I just had, uh, the kids are much more professional. Everybody's got a laptop, you know, and they're, you know, they, they don't travel together. Everybody goes their own way. You know, back in the old days, we had four or five guys jammed in a car. You go to the hotel, uh, just uh, one bed, please. Everybody else behind down in the, in the seat of the car, you know, get the break on the hotel and we put the mattress pad on the floor. And, but uh, the, the guys were, were much, much tighter back then. Is it because the money is so much better now that they're all getting sure. their own hotel rooms and their own Yeah, the money is much, much better as it is in, you know, the, like I said, uh, talking about the average uh, household income. Right. Everything's gone up. Uh, NFL players' money's gone up. Uh, but back in the day, like you said, wrestlers, we were making more money than, than most folks working hard. How is this concept first explained to you? Uh, it's the brainchild of, uh, is it Patterson, I guess? I think Pat, yeah. Pat was a genius for the business, of course, and, uh, and I always got along with Pat. But uh, yeah, that was the first one, and of course, uh, it wasn't, I don't think it was a pay-per-view. That, that no, it was a free either. broadcast right. on USA. And uh, of course, that's the the feather in my cap. That's what I still hang my hat on. You know, folks to this day say, "Hey, you won the first Royal Rumble," and that's uh, I was kind of really disappointed I wasn't in this year's Royal Rumble because I was in last year's. You know, and I had a good response and I had a good time, but. Uh, of course, to be able to win that, that was, uh, you know, one of the, the highlights of my career. How intensely is it booked? You've got uh, 30 guys, and they're given an order. Are you, well, first of all, you're given the order, obviously, when you're going in. Are you given the order when you're going out, and after how long, or is that something you guys are working out? No, so everything, own? you know, nowadays, is, even your verbiage is scripted, of course. But back then. Back, back then, everything, yeah, not, not your verbiage, of course. And I think that kind of hurt the business because the way I cut an interview is different than the way Bossman or Jake or Flair or anybody else cuts an interview. I think it all gets homogenized when you have a group of writers writing verbiage for the same guys. But no, back then, I mean, you knew who was going out when, and, 
And of course, that's one thing about professional wrestling. You know, people say, well, you know, wrestlers, this and that. I mean, you, you sit in and going over a match and going over an involved finish with a lot of things going on, it's quite an art form for guys to pull that off. I mean, you see, we just had um, Freddie Prince Jr., I believe, was a WWE pro, uh, producer for a while. I mean, he, and I talked with him, he's like, I can't believe you guys, you know, you show up at 2 o'clock, boom, 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 and you do it. You know, it's a, it's a, it says a lot about the guys in the ring. The first Royal Rumble match that ever happened was actually not televised. It was um, in St. Louis, Missouri on October 4th. I suppose that's kind of a practice run. Were you in that one, too? I really don't remember that. Okay. I'll tell you the truth. All right. Um, Noteworthy of this event. Also, Gorilla Monsoon was supposed to do the announcement, but he, uh, he suffered a, a mild heart attack and was replaced on commentary by, by Vince. Was the Gorilla as dear a figure as we always hear in WWE locker room? Well, uh, the Gorilla, you know, I always thought he kind of blasted me a little bit, you know, a little bit on the, on the mic more than he needed to. Uh, but, of course, you have to admire Gorilla Monsoon. I mean, to this day, it's the Gorilla position before you go through the curtain. I mean, something that will live uh, forever. He's uh, That's his position, and like I said to this day, it's known as the Gorilla. You tell people, I mean, you go to the WWE shows now, and they have a picture of a Gorilla with an arrow pointing, you know, people... Oh, that That's true? the gorilla position, you know. Yeah. Wow. Um, Vince was allegedly overheard commenting to Howard Finkel in between matches to quote, "Stop looking like a fucking stone and show some interest in the matches." Did you ever hear anything? No, but I, I like Howard actually. I, I think Howard does a great job, and uh, uh, usually I, I would think that he is very in tune to things. So I'm surprised that he he wasn't into that. Jerry, but Vince will be. I mean, he'll be brutal on you. And I guess that's one of the reasons Mick Foley had trouble being an announcer. I've never been an announcer, never been in that position where you have the headset on and have Vince talking to you. But I hear he's uh, very abrupt, <laughs> put it politely. Even when you're doing the announcing. And while you're, you're talking, feet, right, right, yeah, right. like, what the hell are you doing out there? Gotcha. You want to expand and you want to expand everywhere. And it wasn't a question of, um, you know, going into the heart of, of, of somebody else's territory, but when you, when you have a national television show like the TBS program that went everywhere, it was seen everywhere. And you have to think in terms of being uh, a national promotion, maybe a worldwide promotion, but national at that point, and where Crockett started as an, an mid-Atlantic territory, and then little by little started branching out these other places. Um, major markets, New York is a major market. Eventually, uh, to be perceived as a true national promotion, it, it's hard not to say, well, you know, I, I want to make have a presence in New York. Now, maybe you can't get into Madison Square Garden. That's what I was going to ask you, could the they reason. not? Because Vince was running the Omni, it would seem only it makes sense that they would try to put the stake in the heart by going to the Garden. But would he have some kind of ex have some kind of exclusivity with them? Exclusivity is a very bad word to use. You should never use exclusivity because you can you can you could challenge that on on legal grounds. But Vince was a very smart man, and he had a, uh, a man named Ed Cohen who was uh, booking the uh, arenas, and because they had longevity in, in running major buildings. Their logic as presented to the building was, look, I'm a regular repeat customer and we're in this together. And we, we've done well in the past, we want to continue to do well. And the only thing I'm saying is we don't want a, another very similar product to come in, say, six weeks to two months before our date and by the same token we don't want a, a competing product to come in six weeks to two months or whatever the time frame was after just to give us give us that distance well um i forget the exact terminology that they use prime tenant uh -huh. and so it's a uh, kind of a concession that you would give to a guy that's a, that's a regular customer. Hmm. Yeah, you don't want to get sued, and here's a new guy, and you want to give him a chance, but you also want to take care of somebody who's, who's 
I've done good business with you over a long period of time. So that window of exclusion on both sides kept Vince was running the garden every three weeks. He, so yeah. there were no dates in the guard because he had a prime tenant status. What was the uh, company's initial reaction to? Was there any kind of, well, going up to New York now, was it a, was it a big deal to the talent? I don't think it's big a deal to the, to the talent. Uh, I equate a lot of things to baseball. You know, they talk about, you know, the Yankee-Red Sox rivalry. And, the, and I think the media, maybe the fans get more revved up not that the players don't think those encounters are important, they do, but except for maybe a few isolated individuals, it's not a hate, hate thing. We're all in the business together, but there is a pride factor. You know, it's like, well, you know, I, they're there and they're doing well, I'm here and doing well, and if I can go up there and do well too, that mm -hmm. says something about my value in the industry as a whole. This date is notable because um, this bunkhouse stampede pay-per-view is going up against WWE's first Royal Rumble, which they give away for free on USA, basically to counter the pay-per-view that was uh, announced prior. So with them going head-to-head -head like that, did Crockett do anything to prevent Vince's free program from being given away on the date that they had a pay-per-view, or is there basically nothing you can do if somebody has that TV time? Probably nothing that you can, well, there is nothing that you can do. The, w w what ultimately happens, I mean, it's, it's, it's a competitive environment. Everybody's trying to, you know, protect their own turf, protect what they have. But, but the other thing that happens, too, in the television industry, the television industry doesn't want to get into a situation where they're involved in a war. The pay-per-view company wants to see every pay-per-view do incredibly well. So I'm, I bet you there was more pressure within the television executive uh, area mm -hmm. with, you know, this is what I normally expect to do with a pay-per-view and this is what I did while you're airing this. Uh, you know, hey, what are you doing? You know, and a lot of times the decisions weren't that simple because you have strong personalities and they're, they're both trying to take that next big step forward, but the television industry doesn't like to see things like that right. where, uh, and that's why they, as time went on, you saw less and less of that and people would move pay-per-view dates. So you didn't, have, you never, have, you wouldn't have two major pay-per-views competing with each other on the same night because the pay-per-view people are, are more the ultimate losers. I don't know if you remember this, but it was reported that the live event started earlier than the advertised time. So you had people filing into the arena during the pay-per-view broadcast because the wrong time was on the ticket. Mm. I don't know if you remember that. Vaguely, okay. things like that should never happen. But when you, uh, with pay-per-view in particular, you, you have a, a time slot, you have a window. Right. And you, you may have a, a, a pre-thing that, that maybe goes out over uh, free air, but then when the pay-per-view starts, you have a window, and if your show is not over when that window ends... Right, it gets cut <laughs> off. Yeah. Theoretically, you should have an audience in the seats by the time your signal goes up. Yes, things like that mm -hmm. should never happen. Um, talk about the Western States Heritage Championship. It was considered at the time, uh, even today, a little bit of a punchline. Why was it created? What went wrong with it? What was it intended to be? It's so unimportant and so insignificant that I don't even remember it. If you had asked me, was there ever a so-and-so heritage title? And, and I had to come up with an answer and there was a big fat prize. Boy, it would be one of these things. Gotcha. <laughs> Don't remember. <laughs> you know, this is a great opportunity to kind of set the record straight for me with regard to Dusty. Um, Dusty was a very, very strong personality. Dusty was a great in-ring talent and had a great mind for the business and a great work ethic. He was a product of Eddie Graham, who I felt was a genius and, and the person I look at 
as really my true mentor. And he even had connections back to the Funk family, Dory Funk Sr. So there were some great, great minds in the business that just passed this knowledge along. And then Eddie did the same thing to people like Dusty Rhodes, uh, Bill Watts. It, it just, he just influenced a lot of people. Dusty's presence was more than just his ability to book and to, to think big picture and to be creative. He was also a fabulous in-ring talent and had a track record of success. So that made it easier for him to draw people to come in when he was in a position of uh, matchmaking and booking. So Dusty had a lot of the, of the same things that he had done in Florida and been very successful with, the same type of things that would have been done in Amarillo with the Funks. So he was introducing new things that were, and the bunkhouse stampede was a natural for him because of how he often dressed with, uh, you know, a casual shirt and, and, and jeans and, and boots and mm -hmm. tape them up and, you know, and, and kind of like, you know, move the hay bales out of the way in the barn, we're going to go at it. But all of that accepted and, and, and probably true, but is there a responsibility with someone in that position um, as, a, as a marquee talent and also a booker to not overly elevate oneself? Or, or is the gate the justification where you say, listen, people are coming, so we're going to keep doing this. I'm the bull of the woods. I would say that the, uh, the results uh, is the ultimate justification. And, and as time went on, uh, I would be less than honest if I didn't say that, yes, it, it was a problem. I mean, it, even with the horsemen, which I've talked about in other interviews, where um, the horsemen were so successful because we had the ability to give and give every night and, and to get beat up and to be left bloody and in a pile. But as long as we could get back on television and put our side of the story that was also where did they get that concept from, you know, and then that would anger the people and say, I guess they didn't get their butts kicked bad enough last week. I guess they need to get back in there and, and take a worse beating. So we were able to keep doing that. Dusty on the other side, tradition always in the business was, really at the end of the day, the baby face goes over. That, not to say that you ever didn't do something to him to get heat, but at the end of the line at some point, and mm -hmm. then the line never ended because there was always a week after that, but the, you know, you know, the baby face went over. So Dusty, yes, did get over uh, in situations the majority of times. Did Dusty ever lose matches? Absolutely. I had a bull rope match with Dusty in Florida, and I got a win over Dusty in his specialty match. Mm. Now, he beat me to death. Ron Bass came in when the referee got knocked down, clobbered him, put me on top. But in the, you know, my bragging rights are in the, in the record book, it says that uh, I defeated Dusty Rhodes in his specialty type of match. So a lot of times it's not just winning the match. It's how you do it. But to get back to the, to the first part of the question, it, it did cause some tension because Flair, after a while, would say, oh, and he would worry that we're given, given, given so much and we're not getting anything back and this is all of a sudden going to suddenly die. Um, that was probably the greatest criticism against Dusty. But, geez, he was, uh, he was very, very successful. Mm -hmm. I would say if somebody wanted to, to shave Ricky Morton's head, unless that was a, a long-term major thing, I, I can see where, you know, that look of his with the mullet and everything, that, that is him, you know. Uh, if you're going to do something to that, there's got to be a long-term payoff on the other, other side. Again, the problem is that you had a lot of talent there that had a track record of success, and there are times where it's a juggling act where you're trying to keep all the balls in the air and not drop any, and invariably somebody is not going to be completely happy with, uh, with the situation. And they were so hot, though, Yeah, in, in that know. territory. 
why, why the kind of the drastic, it wasn't even like sending them away and bringing them back. They're, do, they're working mid-card, they're doing jobs. Did Dusty have a problem with them? I don't know. It, it, it's like uh, I've had Tully on interviews and he spe speaks openly about it. And Tully will say to himself, you know, well, you know, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. If something was bothering me, I'd, I'd blurt it out. And then I would be, he would say, I would be penalized. All of a sudden, I'm in all these little towns in South Carolina, and I would remind him, yeah, and you know, while you're paying your, uh, uh, your, while you're serving out your sentence, I'm, I'm attached to you, I'm there with you. Uh, it just, it's the nature of the business. And sometimes it's maybe a good thing in the business because it, and this sounds crazy, but you take a guy like Tully that's all these major towns, and all of a sudden he's kind of like, not in some of these major towns for a while because he's over here and he's still doing okay. He's on the main event on the card, probably not making as much money. But then when he comes back, it ultimately improves his longevity. And the hard thing about booking is that you have all of this talent and trying to juggle it and really keep everybody happy is really almost an impossible task. I've got along good with Harley. Harley you know, was a hard-nosed guy, and I had met Harley back in the, uh, uh, in the territory days before he came up to WWE. So I knew who uh, Harley was, and of course, you know, he was famous for carrying guns all the time. And uh, he was a hard-nosed, tough, tough man, and I respect Harley Race. To me, it was great, compelling television, number one. And you look at ways, you know, how many times can, can somebody run in at the end of the match and beat up somebody and the people get mad. And you, you, you are creatively challenged to come up with unique situations to get to the same place, but coming from a completely different direction and especially if the whole thing as it's taking place is interesting. Again, compelling television. Dorton Arena was a, a great venue. Uh, we wrestled there on uh, Tuesday nights for years. And on this particular night, it was nice because there was big roll-up doors at, at the end with a ramp down and the dressing rooms were at opposite ends. And so the setup was away from the ring, almost like there was, there was a party going on that just happened to be in the arena where they were having a TV taping that night. And it's in character with Flair and the horsemen to come in like we own the place. Limos, girls dressed to the nines with fur coats and, and uh, glamorous dresses, and you know, champagne laid the whole thing, you know, almost like you know, this is our world and we're just ignoring what you're doing over there. Well, they're taping a, a TV program at the same time. So it created a great situation for Sting, who was finally in the ring and it's like, he's doing his business and he's watching these bunch of a-holes making jerks of themselves at, almost at his as, as expense. So you can see uh, what's kind of building mm -hmm. up here. And then finally, in, during an interview, you know, Sting has enough and he basically said, you know, calls out Flair, you know, to come face him. And it's like, huh, who does he think he is? You know, trying to pour the rain on our party. Hey champ, I'll handle this. And I had one of those champagne, little, little yeah. things with champagne and walk, walk down there like, you know, well, you know, uh, I'm the king, and I'm with these guys, so I'll go down there. And I went up, and I'm now I'm on the apron, and, and they're staying, and I'm basically, you know, telling him, you know, who are you to think you are? You know, keep your mouth shut and go away. You know, we're having a party back here. And, and of course, it just builds from there to the point where I finally threw champagne in, in his face. I remember standing on the bottom rope, and he just kind of, boom, cuffed me behind the neck. I went in the ring, and I'm wearing a fancy tuxedo. I get back up. Wham, drives me into the corner, turnbuckle to turnbuckle, big singer splash, 
and I fell out of the corner like a big pile of rubbish, all ruffled and things. Dismay. And he picks me up, turns me over, puts me in the scorpion headlock, and now there I'm floundering like a fish out of water. And of course, here comes now. Ah, oh, oh, you know, here they come to the rescue. But you know, it's done, and so now we're all in the ring where where we eventually should have been in the first place, but it was a way to get us there indirectly. And it set the stage eventually for, for, for Flair and who Sting. Who proposed uh, Sting for this? Who recognized that Sting could be the guy for this? Because you had a handful of people. You had the UWF guys up there now. You could have put anyone in that spot. Uh, who was Sting's real big pusher? I, I don't know that there was any one person ever pushing him. Uh, I think Dusty recognized that there was something about Sting, that, that it factor that you, uh, you can't very well explain, hard to define, and you look and, and, so, and some guys either have it or they, or they don't have it. And something about him, he had it. Mm. And what was interesting was that Sting got over with the, with the face paint, with the howl, beating his chest and the Stinger splash, but it was something that at the same time didn't come, nat for some reason didn't seem to come naturally to him. And I remember even in this particular scenario, when he turnbuckled me, when he got me into the corner the first time before the turnbuckle and Stinger splash, he basically you know, got in my face and he just kind of stood there and I told him, how? <laughs> beat your chest. Wow. I'm telling him how to be Sting. It just didn't flow spontaneously from him. Now, when you're watching the thing, you don't see that, you don't sense that. But that was really the essence of the business was, okay, here, here's a guy who I, we think we can draw a lot of money with, but we're going to have to help him. And so... That's what I did, you know, and I'm, I'm eventually laid out there in, in the middle. I'm the sacrificial one that night to create this, the stage where everybody's in. Now, we're all in the ring. He's out on the floor, and, boy, that setup for the confrontation is made. Did he get better ever, Sting, with that? The criticism you always hear is that there was never really a love for the business there. There was um, his bodybuilder, you know, but did he get better? Did he grow into being more comfortable, being a better worker, more natural, ever? I think, I think to be honest, the answer is probably no. Um, drew some money, had some great houses, some great matches, but again, he was in there with Flair a lot of times, and Flair had the ability to elevate his performance. Um, he moved away from the East Coast to California with the idea of getting into movies, I think. So his, his heart was not doing one-nighters, being in the wrestling business. He, you know, he wanted to do other things. And he's continued to, to do well financially in the business, but it's always been on his terms. And even in TNA, he, he didn't want didn't to go on the road and work house shows. He just he wanted to be... TV and, and do pay-per-view and uh, you know it's it's nice if you could do that uh, maybe if you're an Andre the Giant but Andre the Giant went to the towns too yeah he did and there was a guy who was huge and just riding around from place to place was uh, not a very comfortable situation and he did it because that was his commitment to the business. I think it was probably a, uh, Dusty had an influence in it, and Kevin did too. Kevin's always been somebody who uh, was a player. And there, there were at different times a kind of a negative feeling to the, the demon side of Kevin Sullivan that people kind of thought, uh, you know, that you, you have great limitations in most places about how far you could go with that. And, and Kevin could do that and do that extremely well, which as we saw when he was with, uh, with Mark Lewin as the Purple Haze. But 
it was a chance to take Kevin and put him against some legitimate athletes, you know, like the Steiners and Rotundo and and the varsity club. Uh, you know, Kevin they, just wanted to be involved. But they put him with the athletes, the collegiate athletes. They call it the varsity club. And he still be in the devil. Well, that part of him was part, part to, to the degree of his makeup, but it also... <laughs> It also made for a very unique character. Yes, it did. He made it work. Yeah, that's true. The two, you know, Letterman jackets and, you know, he's in the cloak. It's just an odd thing. You know, The Warrior was a good tale, but a guy that changes his name legally to The Warrior says a lot about the man's personality. I mean, he is so... You know, Magnum T.A., and I like Magnum. Magnum became me. I became Magnum T.A. I'm Magnum T.A., Macho Man. He lost uh, Randy Poffo and became Macho Man. Ultimate Warrior was James Hellwicker. Obviously, he lost him long, long ago. The guy has uh, some type of ego problem to, you know, just act and behave the way he does. But you have to respect the man for what he did. You know, supposedly, I don't know if this is true, he held up Vince McMahon at WrestleMania. You know, hey, I, I want more money or I'm not going to go out. And that's a joke to this day. You know, sometimes even on these independent shows, you know, I tell them right before I go out, hey, double my salary or I'm not going to go out there, you know, with the old Ultimate Warrior line. So they, they throw me two bucks and I go out. <laughs> but, uh, Is that going to happen tonight? That better not happen tonight because half board will travel, brother. But, yeah, the, the Warrior was a, a great talent, but uh, he had a, a huge push. And it's like a lot of kids nowadays, I mean, you know, after you know, the first the music starts and they got the big screen with all the stuff and then the fireworks, $2,000 with the fireworks smoke, the guy comes out with the, the $100,000 outfit, gets in the ring and it's... <laughs> to entertain people, 33 years, 31 years, I'm rushing it, right, 33. 31 years I've been wrestling in the ring, you know, and, and back in the old days, you know, they didn't even have music. Michael Hayes is credited for bringing uh, music to wrestling. But you have to have a little more sometimes. Sometimes the package is bigger than the wrestler. Uh, Glacier, who's a nice young guy, is an example. He had a huge uh, opening, and he couldn't follow it. And I think that's a lot today. I mean, they, 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 they uh, check everything and see what the folks like the most. They like the openings. Fans, fans seem to enjoy the openings. And so now they spend all this fortune on the openings, and a lot of guys have trouble following it. I always said, don't give me no fireworks. I want to hear the pop when I come out, brother. It does remain wrestling's one of wrestling's unsolved mysteries. So the first question, why was it dropped so abruptly? Well, sometimes you do something that you think, let's plant this seed and then we'll figure out where we're going to go with it. <laughs> So you plant the seed, and you never see what it is. You see the reaction, so you right away think, oh, wow, there's something here. And then you, you sometimes paint yourself into a corner, and you start thinking, well, what if we eventually expose it that it's this? Where are we going to go with that? That's not going to work. And then, then it, you start going down the list, and then you run out of fingers and toes, and you think, you know, we got nowhere to go with this. All right, so you have the match before you think of the finish, and two guys are standing in the ring, uh, you know, metaphorically. So finally solved the mystery for us. What was supposed to be in that envelope? I don't think anybody ever knew and never thought it through. And, and that happens a lot of times where one thing, you, you may sometimes have a general idea, but there are so many steps in between. And as you take each step, you gauge the reaction, and you, you gauge what, how it unfolded, and then a lot of times you don't go from there to here, you go from there to ooh, over here, and, and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a spider web. This one, it just, uh, uh, spider ran out of web, I think. Right. For something like this, the, the, the bench press deal, are they using legit weights of, of the, the weight we're being told? Yes. Okay. Because um, they, 
they were they were legitimately powerful men. You didn't have to use rubber crowbars and no legitimate. And I I may stand corrected, but I'm of the impression that there may have been something that happened a few days before, but I remember that the injury was a result of what happened in that particular thing that Oh, night. so it wasn't prior, so he, no. he took a legit... Uh, yeah. Okay, from Broken the Broken orbital bone, orbital bone. Gotcha. Yes. Um, of those four guys, who do you think could bench the most? Powers of Pain and Road Warriors. Oh, wow. You know, I, I, that's a good question. I never really thought about that. Animal was just, wow, he was a powerful stud. Not that uh, that Hawk wasn't, it's just that Animal was so big. But then, you know, Warlord, Warlord. Was, was too. And I'm probably not the best judge because the one place of all the places in the world that you would never find me was, guess where? The bar. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the, 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 no, gymnasium. the gym, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, you hear, you know, wow, I saw what this guy did. If, I, I don't know, Barbarian, there's something about those guys, whether it was Tonga, Fiji, wherever they're from, uh, Samoa, those island boys just have a natural strength in them that is just unbelievable. So, not knowing specifically, I would say, I bet it would have been between Animal and uh, Barbarian. Okay. And listen, if ever there is a worldwide competition for curling a Bacardi and Coke, that glorious 90 degrees to one's mouth, my money's on you. Very observant gentleman you are. Billington was a bit to handle, wasn't he? Yeah, both of those guys I thought were. I thought uh, both of them were kind of bullies. And they would pick their shot. If they know they could mess with this guy and get away with it, well, they'd mess with him. They won't mess with this guy because he'll come back on them. So they would pick their shots. And I always, I didn't like that. You know, knobs, knobs will pick on the youngest guy in the business and then they'll pick on Hogan and Flair. So you can't gripe at knobs. He picks on everybody. But guys like that that would, you know, prey on the weak, I, I never liked that. And of course, uh, uh, they were successful too. I mean, the Bulldogs were a, a great team. And I don't know if that's what they said it was stress related. Can we relate to something else too? Yeah, yeah, I think more probably came in a prescription bottle. Gotcha. But uh, of course, back in the 80s also, people would go out of their way to help. That's before lawsuits and stuff really became prevalent and video cameras everywhere. Or a police officer, you have a little trouble in a club, a cop come, you know, get, get out of here, actually, get out of here. Uh, you know, a lot of times people go out of their way to help you, and then all of a sudden the tide changed right around uh, 87, where, you know, people started going out of their way to, to uh, protect themselves and, and hurt you, because if, if, if they get any publicity out of you, then that seems to help them. Tell me if these are accurate. I have three here. Uh, no longer allowed to whip each other into the guardrail at ringside? Yeah, that, that's, uh, of course, and, and I don't know if you've been to local shows or anything. That's a, that's a big deal because the guardrails move. It's a liability issue. Gotcha. You get the guardrail. If guardrail goes into a fan, you know, in the old days, you'd go over and give the fan an autographed picture and say, hey, here's some tickets for next week. Now it's a $100,000 loss. So, right. yeah, no more guardrails. Uh, also in the 88, wrestlers are given a dress code while traveling? Sure. Well, back in 88, uh, 87, in the early days of the WWF, you were working a lot. Nobody was on contract, very few guys, at least that I know of, that were on contract. You work, you get paid. You don't work, you don't get paid. So sometimes you'd run, you know, 30, 40 guys like Jake and uh, Piper were up close to 100 days straight without a day off. And so if you're 100 days on the road, yeah, you could buy with sweats and t-shirts and, uh, you know, the guys started to travel a little raggedy. And I think, it, and also the company, the WWE, started to have a more corporate image 
and wanted to represent that and, and their talent. And the guys that has a dress code on in the NFL, the guys had to dress up a little bit. I think Joel and Bill got along very well. Bill's kind of estranged from his whole family. I don't know how it is now that he's a, a reborn Christian and all that. But uh, yeah, I don't think Joel's heart was ever really in wrestling. Really? Okay. I think as Warrior would use it as a means to an end. I mean, he got in it, got his bread, and tried to move on to other stuff. I think uh, Joel kind of used it as a stepping stone, where many guys love the business. I think he was initially hired, correct me if I'm wrong, to bring some of the the, uh, the music video elements that Bill was doing in UWF, putting together music video segments for some of the uh, baby faces and stuff. The WWF. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what he was, what his position was up there, but I remember him being. Well, it was short-lived, whatever it was. Yes. <laughs> Andre the Giant finally wins his first and only singles title. Of course, he was a big enough draw never to even need a strap, and then how the hell did he get it off him? So you assume that's why he never got one. But talk to me about Andre for a minute. He was at this time certainly in the twilight of his career, but still drawing tons of money, and you would do a very big program with him shortly after this. But your impressions of Andre? Uh, I had met Andre early, early in my career. Uh, when I first I broke in in 79 in uh, Texas with uh, Fritz von Erich. I was still playing football at the time. I went to the Atlanta Falcons. The Falcons cut me. I went to Toronto. Uh, Toronto, I played a while up there, and when they let me go, I came to my hometown, Glens Falls, New York. Arnie Skolin was running a, a show, or WWWF was running a show with Vince Sr. In Glens Falls, my dad and Arnie were buddies. My dad was chief of police in Glens Falls. And uh, he said, well, my kid wrestled a little bit, Arnie saw me, said, hey, he brought me down to Allentown, put me on TV down there. And Vince Sr. said, well, you, you might have a, a little bit of a career, kid, but go learn the business. So they sent me to Hawaii to work for Peter Maivia uh, back in 79 where I met Haku, but that's a whole other story. But um, while I was over there, Andre would stop back in to work for Maivia on, uh, on his way back from Japan. He would, he would hit Hawaii. And I wore a mask and because I was, you know, I was still a relatively young guy, and I was wrestling all the Polynesian, all the Hawaiian boys were all the baby faces, all the Hollies, all the white people, all the white boys were the heels. So I, I wore a mask and I wrestled as a convict, you know, and I put little C's on my mask for the convict, and the fans were like, uh, why'd you put those ears on your mask? I said, they're not ears, they're C's for the convict, damn it. You know, but Andre would come through and, uh, and they had a whole, you know, back then, of course, he was still close to his prime and uh, was a, a huge honor and thrill to be in the ring with him as a, a jabroni kid and uh, work with him a little bit. So, But he impressed me then. And then to, to meet him again, uh, well, actually, I was in Japan with him quite a bit uh, over the years. But I had a, a, I got along good with Andre. Yeah, I, a lot of guys did. He was, he could be an irritable giant. And as Bobby Heenan used to say, he said sometimes he had villagers in his teeth from the night before, you know, because he, you know, he, he could be uh, rough. But I remember Andre used to knock you down, and or even better, I got to tell you the Andre story. Uh, you know, Andre, of course, he's so big, his personal hygiene's not as best, you know. Of course, his gear, we all were working an awful lot there, so he had a unique aroma. <laughs> you could be sitting and go, boss, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> So I, I wrestled Andre, and he was a little inebriated, you know, he was French. <laughs> like the so, wine. Yeah, yeah, so before the match, you know, but, but now we're in the ring, and he's like, step closer, Doug, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> closer. And so we worked out the spike, because I wrestled him hundreds of times. And I would get close to him, he'd grab me by the hair and pull me in. He wore that singlet with the one strap across, and he'd take the singlet off, 
and he'd wrap it around my throat and he'd choke me with it, you know, in a standard spot. So he's like, closer, and I know this tonight he's he's really ripe. So I'm like, okay, you know, boss, I get a little closer. He finally he grabs me, pulls me in, and he goes to wrap the strap around my throat. But instead of going around my throat, he goes like, ugh. So now he starts choking me and he's squeezing all that giant juice out of his gear. And it's going down my throat. And I mean, I was fighting as hard as I ever fought in my life. I mean, I am fighting. I'm 310 pounds. I was benching 505. I mean, I was gassed up in the 80s. And Andre's holding me going, oh, oh, oh. And so finally when he let me go, I was sick to my stomach. I crawled over to the apron and I got sick on the floor. Of course, you're up on the uh, bing and, and it was like part in the Red Sea. It's <laughs> all the fans are like, oh, <laughs> they just scattered, you know. It was great, man. Oh, but, uh, and then, of course, Andre, you, Jake, he used to do it with Jake, too. He'd, he'd knock you down. Boom, you'd, you'd go down. And Jake and I both had long hair. And your hair would be on the mat. He'd step on either side of your head and step on your hair. And he'd grab your arms and pick you up. He'd be like, ah! He'd be pulling your hair as he'd pull you up, you know. And Jake used to come back to the dressing room going, I hate when he does that. I hate when he does that, man. But, uh, yeah, the boss was, at, uh, like I said, didn't need a belt. He was uh, a giant. The, the Prince's Bride, perfect casting. Uh, the Big Show, great young man. Great, probably a better athlete than Andre. Uh, but not a giant. Uh, Kali, not... The Giant, the big, big, impressive men, but I think there was only uh, one Andre the Giant. Very nice tribute. Um, on that same show, uh, the evil twin referee angle happens with the two Hebners. Okay, yeah. Um, they were both working for the company for how long at that point? How did they keep it hidden so that they never, I don't think they ever appeared on camera at the same time. Nobody, it was a shock to me. I, mean, I was a market at the time. Well, I know they was still am, I guess. But. Well, and that's a, I gotta tell you that, that's a term that I think now the fans that are, are, are smart to the business, where computers have, uh, and the internet have helped a whole lot of businesses. I really think it hurt professional wrestling. It kind of pulled the curtain back. I mean, back into like a vase, you know, back before it was very closed, it was very kayfabe, you wouldn't travel together. Now everybody in the world gives you the loose handshake and give you the kayfabe deal, like, and uh, you know the smart mark deal. I never considered fans mark. Maybe in the beginning, before I realized it, mm -hmm. they're not. In, in the old days, they may have been marks. As the marks kind of take, we want to take something away from. You. We want to fool you, and we're going to take. You're a mark, and we're going to get your money from you. No, you're a fan. You come to the show. We give you our performance. And you see the show. Now it's almost become a term of endearment to say, "Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a mark for that guy." It's it, there's no negative. Yeah, well, no, right. Well, so know. much terminology having heat with somebody. I right. mean, from wrestling terminology is now is mainstay in the society. Thus, heat wear, which you can get at heat-wear.com, our apparel line, which we launched. Way to segue week. into it. There, there you go. You did it for me, brother. Do you remember this? Is it true? Uh, was there a bit of a, an issue with Hawk? Uh, Hawkey can sometimes can be hard to do business with. I mean, he's very in tune to having a belt. You know, myself, you know, I've never been world champion, never been intercontinental champion, I've never been world tag team champion. Like Andre, kind of on a different scale, of course. I've never thought the character, the flag, the board, and the hoe is all I need. You know, the belt, even back in the Mid South days. But Honky and Terry Tail and a lot of other guys like to have the gold. Supposedly, they would wear it sometimes at night in the hotel room, you know, entertaining, which is something else. But uh, I hear Flair often wore only the belt. That's what I mean. Yes, a lot of times the guys, the champions, they seem to really start to believe, you know, uh, like they're, they're um, like, who's a uh, Sergeant Carter and Gomer Pyle? Like they're the sergeant. It doesn't make a difference what position you are, long as Gomer Pyle is the star of the show. He's the private. He's, you know, the one that's, that's doing it. A lot of guys wanted to have the belt. They wanted to be the sergeant. Terry Taylor, a good, good buddy of mine. Terry would rather have the belt than have the extra bread. And if you gave him a choice, say, hey, we're going to give you this much more, or you can be champion, give me the belt. Huh. 
February 13th, Superstars of Wrestling TV broadcast during a taped pro. Oh, let me tell you a oh. macho story, brother. So right ahead. Talking, talking macho man. Macho. Macho, macho and Liz and I, and, and Liz, uh, I love you, God bless her. And, and that's why I don't think a whole lot of Lex Luger. I tell you, you know, uh, Lex was always, you know, they always say the best characters are the ones that are closest to yourself. You know, the nar narcissistic Lex Luger. I mean, he was into his deal. Uh, to put his hands on Liz, I just can't accept that, and I won't accept that. Liz, you could, she was a, a beautiful young lady, and you could bruise her up by yelling at her. I can't imagine a 300-pound muscle head putting his hands on her, but that's a whole other story. But, and Macho was a controlling guy, a control freak. He, he didn't want you around Liz. He didn't want you messing with Liz. He kept Liz separated. He wrote the mileage down on the car. When he wasn't around, he'd come back. You know, you've been 23 miles. Where have you been? You know, But she was a, she attracted to guys like that. But anyway, so we, we fly over to Europe, and uh, we all land, and knobs and sags are there, right? And this guy comes up, and Mach and Liz, do you mind if I take a picture of you? And Mach's like, ah, take the temperature, step into it, you know? <laughs> you ready to take the picture? Uh, sags walks in front of him, just lets up, you know, Sags fart. You know, it's like, <laughs> and Macho freaks out, oh my God! You don't do that in front of my wife. You don't do that in front of Liz. He went crazy. And he put Liz, he put her back on the plane, the next plane, and sent her back to uh, New York. So I think uh, Jack Lanza was, uh, Black Jack Lanza was an agent producer. And so it's, Jack calls Vince and says, Macho just sent Liz home. She's on the plane on the way home. Vince sends some of his folks down. Liz gets off the plane, they grab her, they take her, put her on the Concorde, send her back to Europe. So she made three trips to Europe in like a day and a half. And supposedly he calls Jerry, you know, Sags, and he goes, Jerry, that's the most expensive gas you've ever passed. Because <laughs> he fined him for the, the airfare, supposedly. But uh, yeah, Liz was a nice young lady. In my career, through the territory days, the National Wrestling Alliance was a legitimate, huge, big deal. Uh, and I go back to the period of time where Sam Muchnick from St. Louis was the president, and basically they, they controlled the industry. A lot of politics, um, and going from that statement forward, Paul Bosch was probably one of the greatest promoters that certainly I ever worked for. He, he had a unique situation in Houston. Uh, there was Dallas, there was uh, Joe Blanchard's promotion, and then Houston that, that working together as partners, mm -hmm. you were able to, to fill up a week. Paul worked independently. The, the absolute best situation would be to be a featured performer in the North End, the Dallas-Fort Worth End that, that Fritz von Erich controlled, Joe kind of went with the flow. And then if you could also uh, be thought upon by Paul Bosch as somebody that you could draw money with, where that's actually where your big money was, mm. was in, in Houston. So Paul was a, a great promoter, uh, really understood the business, had a very unique situation, and I don't know if it was at that point just to, to give somebody who was held in, in such high esteem you know, recognition in the industry. I, I think at that point, the, the power of the NWA organization of itself um, certainly wasn't there anymore. Right. Let's talk about Jack Tunney. Um, Figurehead president, um, a bit of an odd choice to represent the entire federation, don't you think? Yeah, I didn't really have much interaction with, with Jack, to tell you the truth, and I didn't really know how he ever got that position. He was there when I came up, and you know, he, he, he looked apart. He was a distinguished looking gentleman. But what I enjoyed, what I think when you think Jack Tunney, uh, Billy Red, the announcer. Billy Red Lions. Billy Red Lions. I'm up in Canada. And I'm watching the show up there, and he's like at uh, Make Believe Gardens. And they, the show's at Make Believe Gardens. 
I can't believe you say it. <laughs> but, you know, they're finally like, no, Doug, it, it's Maple Leaf Gardens. I'm like, oh, I could have sworn Billy was saying Maple Leaf Garden wrestling coming up. That's what I think of when Jack Tunney, I think Billy Red. I think uh, I think both those guys are gone, aren't they? Uh, well, yeah, Jack Tunney died in uh, 2004, and I'm sure Billy Red, he would be. Uh, you feel bad if he's not, don't you? Yeah, I know. <laughs> of I course, need to. The guys that are dead, that's a big, uh, big group of fellas. We, off camera for a minute, we did a show with Harley Race one time, and we were talking about uh, WrestleMania three with uh, Moolah. Moolah. Yeah. He had a spot with Moolah, and he goes to me, "This is before Moolah had died." And if that lady was alive right now, I said, "Harley, she is." He goes, "Lillian's alive." He goes, "She must be a hundred years old." <laughs> I remember Mad Dog, and I don't really remember the shows in, the, in uh, particular, but I do remember him having to, to have his leg amputated. Yeah. But it, this I don't really know. It was probably an outgrowth of, of no, going head to that. head with, uh, with, with Vern over those cities, probably. That's how he lost it. his leg? Trying to, no, no, no. no shows. <laughs> <laughs> you go head to head with Vince, you lose a lot more than your leg. Kidding, brother. I thought there you're going with that. Jerry McDevitt's <laughs> drafting a letter to me right now. <laughs> For even mentioning it. <laughs> Do you own your name? Do you own Hacks? Yes. Jim Duggan? Uh, Thank God. Yeah, a lot of folks come up, you know, they're like, uh, Jim Duggan, is that your real name? I'm like, well, it's not a real catchy stage name. I'd like to come up with something better than Jim Duggan because everybody mispronounces it Duggan. Right. You know, which was my whole interview back in the old days, you know, when I first started as uh, Big Jim Duggan. You know, I, I wore, wore red and black trunks and a gold bathrobe. <laughs> and Vince Senior is actually the guy who comes up and he says, uh, Kid, he said, Get rid of that gold bathrobe and come up with something better than Big Jim, you know. So that's why I went to the convict. <laughs> Who came up with Hacksaw? Actually, uh, Buck Roby, Bruiser Brody, and myself uh, when we went to San Antonio. Because uh, my, uh, go through it quick again. Uh, Texas, I broke in. Uh, WWE, WWE, then Hawaii came back. Still didn't know anything. Went to Georgia Championship Wrestling as Big Jim. That's where I met the Freebirds and one of my best friends of my life, Terry Gordy. And then I uh, went to Pensacola, where I worked for Fuller, which was a whole other story, because that Pensacola territory was, it was great. We lived on Pensacola Beach. I had a 500-a-week guarantee. I was living with a little stripper, you know. So Brody and uh, Roley went from Georgia. They went to San Antonio, and they, uh, they called me to, like, you know, come on out here. Brody needs somebody to work with, you know. And I'm like, well, things are going good here. <laughs> and then uh, Big Bruiser called me and said, you know, get out here and learn the business. And so I went to San Antonio uh, for Joe Blanchard. And we all sat around and came up, you know, came up with Hacksaw. Uh -huh. And the, 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 the line is, they're like, well, ha where'd Hacksaw come from? I said, well, back from my football days where I used to cut through the wedge. But actually it was a Skull session, sitting around with Brody and Buck Robley. What position did you play for? Uh, I was an offensive guard. Were you a West Texas State guy? Or no, no, but I was Southern Methodist University, the Mustangs, the Harvard of the South. You won the Hula Bowl this year. I guess it goes way back. So I used to carry a knife all the time. Yes. Uh, bad news was a, a bad news guy. I mean, like I said, I didn't really know the guy, but you could, you could, you, of course, it was a snake pit of tough guys. Back in the 80s, there was no walk in the parks in the dressing room. It was a much tougher, rougher atmosphere. Many of the young guys today wouldn't have, not a chance. Evan Bourne, come on. I mean, these guys, uh, it was, uh, uh, old, most of the guys were older. Uh, rougher, tougher men. It was a, a, a tougher business than it was now. Bruno at this time is, is not shy about voicing his, his dislike for Vince and the company. Were you hearing any of this in the sure. locker rooms? Sure. Yeah, and I can never understand Bruno. If it wasn't for wrestling and the WWE or the WWE, yeah. Bruno would be working at a steel, uh, steel mill somewhere. I mean, come on. Sure, okay, you, you, know, you know what you're getting into when you come in. 
You know, you know it's not the NFL where you got the Players Association. You know it's a tough, rough league. And I did a talk show with a young kid that just got canned by the WWE. He goes, you know that Vince McMahon, he treats us like pieces of meat. I'm going to go, son, what do you think you are, kid? You want a friend, go buy a puppy. Welcome to the big leagues. If you don't produce, they flush you down the toilet. You stay as long as you can, and then sooner or later that, that flushing sound is going to happen. It's a tough, rough business. And for guys like Bruno to be bitter about it, he made more money doing this than he would have anything else. I mean, how can you be bitter about something that, for me, I've been, like I said, 31 years in the business, supported my family, put my kids through school. It's been a great business for me. I invested in a pair of boots and a pair of trunks, and I made a livelihood. Uh, it's reported that after Bruno gives his notice, he gets a call from Linda McMahon informing him that they have, in fact, trademarked Living Legend, and he'd no longer be able to use this. They were very trademark happy. Did they attempt to trademark Hacksaw? Well, I think when you sign a contract, you sign over your deals for a while, but they can only have it while you're on contract. But yeah, they're, and they're, you know, as so many guys left the WWE and went to WCW back in the day, Bruce the Barber Beefcake, no more. Big Boss Man, Big Bubba Rogers. They couldn't take their character with them. Because uh, actually, if the WWE comes up with your character, Undertaker is. That's, that's their product, that's their property. Hacksaw Jim Duggan, I was Hacksaw before I came in. Hulk Hogan, the same thing, Macho Man. So we have control over our team. One of the noteworthy things that happens is the Iron Sheik makes his return after uh, to the Garden State after, ironically, on the Garden State Parkway, getting in a little trouble. Right. You hear about that? No, I didn't. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Benoit couldn't pop that off the top list. I mean, you know, go out and butcher your family. Sheik and Duggan on the Garden State Parkway still up here. They still talk they about that. They still talk they? about that. And you know, and everybody thinks me and the Sheik are, are good friends. Yeah. We're not. You're not? No, and we never were. Uh, the, the story is I was relatively new to the company, came up, we flew into Newark, I met the Sheik, uh, you know, every invitation, Sheik, I have no credit card, maybe you give me a ride. Well, like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a ride, what the hell, the Sheik asked me for a ride, I'm glad I'll give you a ride to uh, Asbury Park, I'll day that will live in infamy. And uh, so the Sheik, Sheik bails in with me and we're driving out, he goes, Maybe stop and we get some St. Pauli girl beer. Well, I'm not a big beer drinker, obviously, but I said, okay. Yeah. So we got some, and that's, well, you know, boom, I got a little marijuana. It's the 80s, Bill Clinton smoking pot. I said, so I had like, you know, a quarter bag, three or four doobies rolled up in, in the seat. So we, we smoked the doobie and we put it down. And now we're driving down. He says, maybe have a beer. I'm like, well, yeah, nice afternoon. Okay, I'll have a beer. So as soon as I'm drinking a beer, we go buy a state trooper. He's like, Troopers pulls in. I'm like, you know, I'm from Louisiana. I was living in Louisiana at the time. You know, I have drive through daiquiri huts in the 80s. You know, it's not like, what am I doing wrong? So they pull me over and they're like, um, can't drink and drive. And I said, yes, sir. And as he stuck his head in the window, he was like, okay, you out of the car. And I'm like, yes, sir. He says, uh, do you have anything in the car you should know about? Like, oh, shit. So there's a small amount of marijuana under you know, the seat. You know, I'm figuring he's like, well, give it to me and get out of here. I'm against the car, you know, feedback is spread. I'm like, well, wait a minute, officer. <laughs> Did he, had he recognized you at this point, do you think? I don't think so. Okay. I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. But uh, anyway, boom, uh, now I'm on the side of the Garden State Parkway, feedback and spread, getting frisked, you know, and now the cops are, pfft, now the, there's more come, you know, and they realize that people are going by, hey, isn't that? <laughs> but anyway, so uh, they put me in one car, and now they pull the chic out, and they, and they go through his stuff, and they put him in another car. So they drive us to the, pool, uh, the, the station. So we get there, and now they, they go through all our bags. I mean, every, because we have to keep receipts for everything. And, you know, and they're going through all the receipts, and they're going through all the Polaroids of the old lady and stuff. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> they're like, what's this? I said, it's upside down. <laughs> no. So anyway, they went through all my stuff. You know, I, I had the drinking while driving, and I had misdemeanor amount of weed. And, uh, but the Sheik, now they go through all Sheik stuff, they didn't find nothing. So they, they get into his wallet, they open it, they go through his wallet. He had three grams of cocaine in separate containers. So he had a felony cocaine arrest. 
and I had uh, the misdemeanor arrest. So he had to go in front of a judge, and you know, I sat there at the police station waiting. He came back and got in the car, and they took us back to our car. Was they didn't even tow the car back then? They left it on the parkway, so we went and they dropped us back off the car, and we're like. We can still make the show. <laughs> so we drove to Asbury Park and we did the show that night. And so then I called my wife, uh, of, well, we've been together 24, almost 26 years now. I called my wife, I'm like, uh, got arrested, but I don't think nobody knows about it. <laughs> she calls me the next morning, she goes, everybody knows. <laughs> it's about seven in the morning, everybody already knows, man. And. Uh, she says, you know, your family, all your family's called, the office is called, everybody's up, because no, nobody had cell phones, of course. Yeah. And uh, so my first call to him was my dad. God bless him, the chief of police at that time, uh, still in Glens Falls, and I mean, he got really bombarded. I mean, they really went after him. You know, what about your son, cocaine, marijuana, <laughs> drinking beer on the parkway? And so I called my pop, and he's like, did you get arrested for cocaine? I said, no, sir. I said, I had marijuana. He said, well, I know sooner or later you get arrested for that. You know, you smoked that weed. I said, yes, sir. But from then on, my pop was very supportive, though. He, he's, he's been great. And he and my whole family is the one that got the brunt of it, because I went back to Louisiana and became a recluse. But uh, and then, so my next call was to Vince. And I've never gotten through that quick in my life to Vince. You know, he used to call Jim Duggan for Vince McMahon. And, Hold, please. And you listen to about eight or ten songs. Ding, 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 ding. So I'm like, uh, Jim Duggan for Vince McMahon, hold, <laughs> Jim? <laughs> I'm like, uh, Vince, and I uh, remember verbatim to what he said to me to the day I die. He goes, Jim, what have you done to us? And I said, Vince, I'm embarrassed and ashamed. And, you know, I, whatever you do, I understand. He says, turn in your tickets and go home. Boom, and he hung the phone up. Because back then we had big packets, month, month worth of tickets, you know. And uh, I did. I, I turned in my tickets and I, I flew home. And my buddy Jake, you know, tried to schmooze it over. You know, he's like, Vince, it's okay. You know, don't worry. And Vince had a big uh, promo at, in Buffalo, I believe, or Niagara Falls, one of the two cities, the next day where the show was. And he's pounding the podium. He says, Doug and Sheik will never, ever work for the WWE again. This business is bigger than a six pack and a blowjob. <laughs> you know? And uh, so Jake called me, oh, you're screwed. <laughs> and so for a few weeks, I just uh, moped around in Louisiana. And, uh, finally, I said, well, i got to make the move. And I called uh, Dusty down at WCW. And I set a meeting up to fly to Atlanta. And Bruce Pritchard called me and says, you know, don't do nothing drastic. Just lay low for a little while and we'll try to get you back in. So I laid low for a little while and they brought me in. And then where I'm in the dressing room, finally I come back. And Hillbilly is a great guy, real up simple as Jim, and Hillbilly and I get along now. We've done a few different projects together. But back then, of course, our heads, we butted heads a little bit because his character and my character were kind of close. And we used to do the primetime show, which was uh, Bobby and Kurt, and me and Hillbilly on either sides of the table with Vince. So we're in the dressing room, and Hillbilly goes, You know, that Vince McMahon, he lied to all of us. He said he never hired Doug and Sheik, and there's Doug and sitting right over there. I'm like, Hillbilly, can I talk to you in the shower? Shut your mouth! What the? And you know, Hillbilly, that's like boss man, he's dumb like a fox. What? I do something wrong? I, I, I'm sorry, did I say something? You know, but uh, a, a, a bust that would have killed 99% of the guy's careers, I think. Uh, and I never recovered it professionally. I think that. I've never recovered from that arrest, even though I've had a successful career. But like I said, I've never been world. And I was on the fast track then, you know, WrestleMania three, the big one, ninety-three thousand people. I came out with a two by four. I was whacking everybody with a two by four. Nikolai and the Sheik, and then you know, Nikolai was singing the national anthem. And I tell the young guys, uh, crime time, those kids. I come down. I said, I used to come down and I cut the microphone wire while I was singing the national anthem. They're like microphone wire. <laughs> I'm like, okay, wise guys. <laughs> of course, I got to tell a crime time story. And they always bust my chops. They're like, Hacksaw, every time you go out there, the crowd goes crazy. You get a great pop, but they're like, oh my God, Hacksaw Duncan, I thought he was dead, you know? So my comeback is like, uh, you kids are still here? I thought your 15 minutes were up, boys. <laughs> now, Vince McMahon gets news of, of the bust. 
Uh, yeah, of course, Vince McMahon, who's never touched a joint in his life, clearly. Nobody can throw stones. <clears throat> <clears throat> never touched anything in his life. Uh, you, he, gets, you give, uh, he gives you that disapproving uh, phone call. Uh, you think he was angrier that you got caught or that you got caught together? Together. Without a question. Probably had less to do than a little bit of weed than he did with exposing business. Back then, yeah. Nowadays, you know, but back then it was still kind of kind of kayfabe a little bit. And of course, in New York, New York Daily News, we didn't make the front cover. Of the, we made the back cover, though. Sports cover. It was a big picture of the Sheik and me. It said, boozing bozos. And it was, you know, coke, marijuana, beer, down the garden. It was totally taken out of context and proportion. And of course, it never specified, you know, misdemeanor arrest, felony arrest. We were always painted with the same brush. But uh, to this day, you know, I don't blame the Sheik, and I don't know if the Sheik blames me or not. We, even though we've seen each other many times, we never really discussed it directly. But we were both over 21, and we made our own beds, and we got a lie in it. All right. You know, guy, like I said before, and it sounds like the same story over and over, guys come and go and there's only so many places of uh, high up in the card where guys feel that their, their talent is being fully utilized. And so some guys just think, you know, hey, it, it, it's, there's, there's somewhere else that I could go where I'm going to be elevated and ultimately probably make more money than I would here. And, and, guy, and guys go. At this time, is he allowed to contribute ideas to, to Dusty? Um, Eddie would go on to book, but is he mm -hmm. at this point able to come up with anything, or is there no creative end to his work? I think everybody. Uh, it's not like Dusty's philosophy was my way or the highway. Dusty certainly had uh, a vision, but he also listened to a lot of other people. Uh, you know, that's one thing I, ha I have to say about Dusty. He, and I don't know about Eddie Gilbert in particular, that one individual, but Dusty would listen to, to other people. And if you had ideas to, to take something or if he had an idea and then you ran with it and enhanced it greatly and, and then the end product was still maybe a seed planted by Dusty, but a lot of other mm -hmm. people had sure. input. A lot of times you know, what, what the horseman did was to take a situation and then, uh, you know, we would run with it and it would be basically, we would make it, make it happen and just the talent of all the people involved made the end result just, uh, you know, great. Mm -hmm. This harkens back to what you said before. You're in the public eye now. You, you, our society is getting litigious. Lawyers are getting busy. Mm -hmm. So you're a target now. It's not just sure. enough to be famous, make, make a big living for your family now. Now you're a bit of a target. Do you ever, you ever feel that you yeah, Oh, yes. I've been sued a few that. times. Okay. And that's the old joke. You're always a phony wrestler until you go to court. <laughs> you go to court, you're a trained killer. It goes like this, 10, 20, 30,000. <laughs> Every time you whack it, they're racking it up, you know, and you bump into somebody sometimes, you're going, I'm going to sue you. I said, well, I'm getting my money's worth, brother. We're not done yet. You know, <laughs> you know so uh, yeah, you got to be very conscious, and especially nowadays, because just uh, recently I was up in um, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, did a, a, a two-week tour up there this past summer. And uh, this guy just, it was, the asshole magnet, man. He just came right to me. Yeah, I want in trouble. As soon as, you know, and usually I'm very calm and usually have security with me just to intercept people like that. You know, it doesn't have to be a big imposing guy. Somebody just say, yeah, you know, have a good night and just schmooze the guy off. But now, you know, I'm a little inebriated and this guy's kind of rude, so I'm getting angry and as I'm getting everybody to place. Boom, boom, boom. Everybody's got their cell phone cameras out. Everybody's videotaping the whole thing. So, yeah, and had to put my hands in my pocket and walk out. You have to be very conscious of that nowadays, sure. Everybody's looking to sue you. In the time I was sued, 
I had a guy come, he was three seats into the row at a wrestling show, came past two other people and punched me and I hit him back, but I hit him back twice. And they said I used excessive force in defending myself and he, he won the lawsuit. Really? Even though I had a police officer witness that he punched me, they said I should have let the police officer hand. But now, now I'm coming out of the ring, I'm blowing smoke. I got snot, spit, and sweat going every which way, and all of a sudden, boom, I hit, boom, boom, I hit him, I just kept going, you know. And the next thing I know, boom, get served with the papers. Now I gotta fly back to Monroe, Louisiana, I gotta go through court, gotta get a rent a car or a hotel. And I'm in, my suit's a little tight, you know, my tie's not straight, and this guy's like, I don't know what happened, the wrestler hit me. $40,000. No kidding. Yeah. Rick works that night, he works the next few, he takes no time off. Uh, some would say, you know, remarkable dedication, incredible champion, represents, some would say, you're a dad? What kind of dad are you? Where do you stand on this whole thing? Wow, that, yeah. that's a great question. And I don't know that there's a simple answer. Again, I equate a lot of things to baseball. There was a time where you were on a baseball team and for the baseball season, you were there for the season. And anniversaries and births and uh, even deaths within the family were things that you, it was unheard of for someone getting a leave for a couple of days to, to go somewhere. And now it's not uncommon to hear where somebody from a key member of the coaching staff uh, leaves for 30 days to, to be with their, their wife who's dealing with a, a, a pretty tough situation and oftentimes they don't, they don't give you the details. So I think we as a society, our, our, our culture is such that we, we look at, at things differently and we're more forgiving and, and not so much, well, you know, if you leave for a day, you're not dedicated. And I think the wrestling business was that way mm -hmm. too. And, um, and Ric Flair had a work ethic of, of just, you know, the people there that night bought a ticket to see him, and he felt a responsibility to be there as advertised. Has that changed some over the years? Yes, but primarily that was uh, the, the culture in the business that you know we were on the road and, and, and we missed uh, birthdays and anniversaries and, and births of children, and it just was how the business was because you have to remember too, and I'm, uh, and, you can say, well, certainly at Ric Flair's level, there had to be some exceptions. But in those days, if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. Even when there were contracts, contracts just kind of tied your services up. But when, when you worked, you got paid. If you were hurt, you still figured a way to work. And what happened was the guys that surrounded you helped you get through the night so that you still were there and, and, as, and as best as you were physically possible, gave, give the people what was, uh, what was advertised. So there are some, some that would look at Rick and say, well, you know, wow, that's a shame. He, his place was there with his wife at that time. And there, were, there will be just as many people and say, you know, he's demonstrated his entire career, his dedicated dedication to the business. And I respect that too. So I don't think there really is uh, a correct answer or an easy answer. Now Mark Young is actually Mark Scarpa, Chief J's son. Is this the best they could do with Chief J's son? An enhancement match worked what? Three times did I hear? Well, never blossomed after that neither. Or have they, I mean, they, at least they gave him the opportunity. You know, you, you can't say Big Jim Duggan's going to turn into Hacksaw or whoever uh, the Blade Runners were turning into Sting in uh, Ultimate Warrior. They gave this kid a chance as, what was his Mark called? Young. Mark Young. They gave him a shot. That's all you can ask for is a shot, man. I mean, 
even though it is, it's not like uh, amateur wrestling where you, you say you want to wrestle this guy, you wrestle. If you win, he wins. Mm -hmm. You're you're on the team. He's not. It's a little more, you know, objective. I think you do a good job. But if you go out there and you get the people standing up, you get the people standing up. Talk to me about Chief J as a road agent. I like Chief J. Yeah. yeah, I did. I mean, you know, he could be kind of brutal. And of course, compared to George Steele, you know, George would critique your interviews. And he'd be like, you know, you do this on your interview, and you're like, mine. <laughs> I mean, he's going to tell me how to critique an interview, you know. But uh, the chief, uh, the, the agents back then, which were agents, I mean, they were almost kind of, uh, which is a very tough job. I wouldn't want, you know, Arn Anderson and those guys' job nowadays. It's a, it's a hard job. You're one of the first ones at the arena, you're one of the last ones to leave. Yeah. Anything goes wrong, they call you. Yeah, it's a tough job, but the uh, chief I got along with. We did a very interesting show with uh, Rene Goulet, who right. chronicled the life of the road agent. Not, not a fun, uh, not always a fun. Job. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you Rene's story. Uh, we're what all, was his nickname? Sarge? Was he the Sarge? Or? Yeah, yeah, Sergeant Goulet. Yeah, yeah, Sarge. Uh, we're all over in uh, Europe. And boss man Kurt. And, uh, we all chip in, give Nobsy some some bread. Nobbs gives the bread to the guy to bring him back some uh, party favors. <laughs> and so the guy finally comes back with the, the weed thing and goes up to Sarge. He goes, I got this for Nobbs. Sarge's like, what? <laughs> I got this. Give this to Nobbs. He gave it to the It was a, a huge smudge over there, man. This is a time now where WWE is, is trying to uh, put away the blade a little bit. Right. And uh, you got bloodied up. Maybe it was a hard way. Was it your mouth? Oh, or yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what you're talking about, right? The uh, Which elevated me from a mid-card guy, actually, to a main event guy. Where Andre was out there and he says, I challenge anyone, you know. Yeah. Like, like, if there's a giant, I wrestle him. Big Show, Kali, you know, Yokozuna, Andre, you know, Big John Stud. Come here, Hacksaw, go get him, you know. They feed me to these guys, right? So they're like, Andre, yeah, they're dug it. come on, Andre's out there. So I run down, you know, I got my two by four, and Andre's looking at me, and I got my chin on his belly, like, I'm not afraid of you, I challenge you. So Andre's like, Ugh. and he went to grab me, and when he did, his thumb hit my, my lip, and just, I still got the scar on my lip where he just almost tore my upper lip off. But it worked out great now, because now I'm just gushing blood, and then he's got me by the throat, he's choking me down, he's choking me down, now I'm down both knees, he's towering over me, and I'm just got, just covered in blood. And as I'm down there, I'm like, find a two by four, boom, I hit the boss with a two by four, he goes down like a giant redwood, never been knocked out in his career, right, boom, he goes down, we go off camera, I'm standing over him covered in blood, ha! Elevated me from a, a mid card guy to a main event guy. Did you get any heat with the office because of the blood? I mean, no, no, no I mean, it wasn't my fault. No, they didn't. Yeah, that was just the hard way. the splash they're expected to make? Mm. Probably not, because they were very, very similar uh, to the Rock and Roll Express. Uh, you could ask me the same question, well, did Demolition have the same impact in the WWF as the Road Warriors had here? And as successful as they were, and they were, they had two, I mean, they started with the uh, Bill Eady and Barry Darso, two extremely talented guys, but the the wrestling fan is uh, sometimes a little bit more sophisticated than we give them credit for, and they look at that and they and and they will tell you pretty quick, well, that's the WWF version of the Road Warriors, and they see it for what it is, and they're giving a hell of a shot though. I yeah, mean, they come oh, yeah. in and go over the Midnight Express. Yeah, well, if you're gonna if you're gonna try it. <laughs> Do it big. Do it big, <laughs> and you never know. That's the other crazy thing about the, the business, is you don't know until you try. Mm -hmm. So if you have reservations before you do it, and you think, well, I'm not sure about this, so I'm, I'm not gonna, 
I'm only going to go halfway. Uh, things, then they don't even have a chance. How do you thwart this? Let's say we're sitting here, we're the, we're the Crockett's, we need to, you know, it's our livelihood, we're going to need to get into larger buildings, we're seeing the demand is there for a product, we have our national television, can you pay more than the WWF? What can you do? I, I think you really answered your own question. I mean, nothing. There's really nothing that you can do. And, and again, you have to look at it from the standpoint of the venue. You're a valued customer. You, you've been coming and running your shows. Some do huge business, some not so huge business. And maybe, maybe you'll come here for one of the major pay-per-views, come to my building. Or, and so if you have a regular customer, you're gonna take care of that customer. Mm -hmm. Now here's somebody over here and, and most of them, if they're brutally honest about it, will say, well, you know, I'd like to give them a chance but there's two problems. I don't want to get sued by them, and I don't want to tick you off. Mm -hmm. So they, they were in a pretty tough situation, and uh, you end up going to another building that they, that they can't run and always meet that 60-day window on both sides. So mm -hmm. if you can't go to the garden, you can't go to the Meadowlands, but all of a sudden a date, there's a date where you can work around that and go out to the New Haven or to the Nassau yes. Coliseum, well then you go right. and you take your shot at it there. Heel manager to heel manager or heel manager on heel manager, talk about Gary Hart. One of the greatest, underrated. Uh, when I first broke into the business as a, as a wrestler, Gary Hart was managing Rip Hawk and Sweet Hansen in, uh, for the Crockett Promotions. And Gary was a very, very, very talented guy. Uh, he ended up in Dallas, and I went in there later with, uh, uh, with a run once I was established as a, as a manager. And Gary was smart enough to know that as much heat as he had by me coming in for at least a period of time, I was, was going to have heat because I was something new and he'd been there for a while and he had enough confidence in his own ability to say, okay, I'll back off of that situation and kind of be a half-assed baby face. And we ended up with confrontations with each other, drew a lot of money as a result of it. And in the end, you know, it's like, I think he, he embraced Jose Lothario that he had fought and then finally at the end screwed Jose Lothario. It was right back where he started, but we drew a lot of money in between. Gary, unfortunately, never got to the big show in New York where he got the national recognition that, uh, that he should have. Brilliant man also, Gary Hart. Yeah. Gary Hart's guest booker is available on our website. We shot it the night before he died, as a matter of fact. So you should know firsthand really what a brilliant guy he and was. And what, what an impact he made on all of us. We all left that night saying, oh my God, I can't. Yep. A and a sweet, nice man. We didn't expect you to see on TV and then you expect he was one of the nicest guys. Yep. Al Perez, who never got that big time break, but is always regarded as a very good worker, um, maybe with a little bit of an attitude problem. True? Mm. Maybe I don't remember, but there's, there are, and I want to mention names, there are guys like him in the business who look good athletically, uh, had, this, had this, the, the in-ring skills, and could do virtually anything, but it, that it factor just wasn't there, and I can't put my, I, and no, I don't think anybody else can either put my finger and say, well, it's this specific thing about him. It's either there or it's not there. And ultimately what it comes down to is the public or the judge. They are the ones, because some of these guys have, have had a chance to be pushed and it, 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 it didn't bear fruit. And so, it, again, it's the public mm -hmm. that, that recognized that it factor. And, and there have been a lot of guys who did not have the look did not have the athleticism and the skill level that drew a ton of money because they yeah. did have that it factor. So it's a huge, huge component. 
in the makeup of somebody that's successful, in, at least in the wrestling business. Never works well. He wasn't the only one who was kissing Cheryl. I was about to say, it doesn't ever work well when the wives are brought into the locker room. Well, actually, my wife's been in the ring a few times. Yeah. In angles? In kind of a Well, Goldberg got me at WCW uh, after my uh, kidney cancer, and he worked me over, and I had the, the juice going, and my wife came down. Okay. Uh, when Yokozuna broke my ribs with uh, WWE, they did a little deal uh, with her, you okay. know, crying. Uh, she's been on camera a few times, but not really to the extent that... Uh, and actually, she beat <laughs> uh, Sensational Sherry, when Sherry was a woman's champion, my wife. Little known fact. Yeah, the deal was it was uh, Some trivia. Yeah, it was uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. We, we still joke about it to this day. It was uh, like coming up here, a huge snowstorm. So Velvet McIntyre was supposed to wrestle uh, Sherry. Velvet didn't make it. A lot of a third of the card didn't make it. So Jack Lanza was the ref or the agent. He's like, well, your wife has been in the ring. And back in Louisiana, she actually wrestled in the ring. And I said, well, yeah, she's been in a few times. He goes, think she'll work with Sherry? I'm like, great. So she put on her gym clothes and she ran down. She, I just told her to wave and smile. It was scared to death. She waved and shut, smiled. The referee rang the bell. Sherry jumped her. The referee tried to break it up. Sherry tossed the referee. Boom, DQ'd. Never beat her. You know, got a payday, too. I was going to say, That was a deal about payday. Macho. Great way. You travel with your wife, double payday, double bonus. That's true. Um, but now Cheryl. Go ahead, take that one. Uh, Cheryl, yeah, I, I like Cheryl. She, like I said, Jake, that's when Jake and I were tight. Actually, Jake and Cheryl uh, both were at our wedding and uh, got married in South Carolina. Uh, but Jake has been, I don't know, four or five times. Jake's a high maintenance kind of guy on the relationship, which a lot of wrestlers are. You know, wrestlers, they're always the ones that have the one night stand. Okay, you're on the road, you're in Portland, Boston, Miami, wherever. There's all kinds of girls, all kinds of drugs, all kinds of booze, whatever you want. So yeah, the guys would have the one night stands, but the wife is the one that would have the affair. She's in the same town, she knows this guy, she knows the guy at the gas station, she knows the guys at the grocery store. They're the ones that would fall in love because their husband's out running around. So it's, it's a high, high divorce rate, high drug rate, alcoholism rate, suicide rate, a, a tough business. But a lot of people put the heat on the business. Uh, Three of, three, of my best, three of my best friends ever in the business, the only three guys that I've ever lived with in 31 years in the business that I lived with, all three are dead. Gorgeous Gino Hernandez, Terry Gordy, and just recently, God bless him, Steve, Dr. Death Williams. Mm -hmm. And I'm a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to put any of that heat on the business. It was all our personal choices. And I think it would have happened if we were loading trucks or working the, wherever. <laughs> I'm sure the bat w with the re there was a reason to have the bat out there and then that created a scenario where where you know Jimmy Crockett got hit and and something had to be done to Dusty in the way of a punishment and so that was the punishment and it was a, a very involved scenario that created a situation where the Midnight Rider could emerge. Now the Midnight Rider in Florida had done extremely well. It really had. And it was something that made for fun television. I say fun in the sense that here is a situation where everybody knew who the Midnight Rider was. We know who the Midnight Rider was. And you would look at somebody like Jim, Jimmy Crocker or whatever and say, who is it? He would look at you with that dumb look as if, and you couldn't make him admit it. So then it, it, it creates endless possibilities of like, okay, if we get him and take the mask off and show you firsthand that it is him, or show an authority figure like the referee who can verify, yes, it is him, then this and this and this will happen, right? Mm -hmm, okay. And so even something as simple as the match level the referee gets knocked down, wham, you grab, you pull the mask off, and you rip, oh, he's down. <laughs> and you go and you wake the referee up, and by the time he gets back up, the mask is back on, and you turn, oh, man. If you think about it, it, it is so simple, 
But sometimes the most successful things are things that are just that simple. Again, I had mentioned earlier that sometimes things in this business have great success, run their course, and then often, uh, and this may have been a different conversation than, that you and I had before, where the, where the wrestling promotion tries to then take something that was successful before and then recreate it or repackage it at a different time, yeah. in a different place, surrounded by different people. And you know, whether it's because it's been done one time or it's just the, 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 the players that surround, it just doesn't have the same impact. And I think this is a, That's what a happened here. Again, I'll come back to the comment that I made earlier. There was probably more heat within the television industry mm. of somebody putting on a free wrestling special the same night that that they're run that they're running pay per view because it's costing somebody it's costing Vince some money but it's also costing a lot of other people because basically the pay per view providers and the promoter are partners in the mm -hmm. deal and when they lose out there they're not happy yeah. either and probably the you know head of programming of the of the the network that's running three free program head head up against it. They're saying, "Well, what are you doing?" Mm. Just by nature of television, more eyes land on the Clash of Champions broadcast on that day than did on WrestleMania, mm -hmm. um, and actually it produces arguably one of the best matches of the year between Sting and Flair. Now we look at the star power that gets brought to the table. It's kind of interesting. WrestleMania, you have Bob Uecker, Vanna White, Gladys Knight, all big names at the time. On the Clash, we we're treated to Jason Hervey, who at the time was a cast member of the Wonder Years, uh, Ken Osmond and Eddie Haskell of the new Leave It to Beaver. How was Eddie Haskell, first of all? Did you hang with him uh, that night? Or? No, no. Okay. no, I don't think he... <laughs> <laughs> but Jason Hervey's an interesting person to bring up because he's a fan of wrestling, mm -hmm. yeah. and he will then go on to work there creatively. Is there any inkling that he's got a gift for that at the time, or is he just another star in the locker room? Mm, another star in the locker room. Coming in for a visit. Yes, and, and probably living his dream of, uh, of being successful in uh, um, another genre, and now all of a sudden he's been a fan, and now he's here. Uh, it's funny. Uh, there's baseball players that are like that too, that, you know, like Persinski with the White Sox got involved in a situation and wrestling could not pay him anywhere near the kind of money that he's doing over there. But this is something that he does 162 days out of the year and yet he's a big fan over here and he's able to, to get involved for a day and they'll do it for, for, yeah. for next to nothing just for the experience. He also receives Missy Hyatt as a prize later in his life. As did any guy that went to NWA, really. <laughs> I, I think about it. I didn't say that. He, no, he Missy, did. I said it. Yes. I love Missy. And Missy's but, I, and I, but she'd be the first to uh, tell you. Oh, uh, yes. And I, and I know I'm probably not alone. I have some DVDs but. I can send you um, that we've produced, unfortunately. The Crockett family started as a, f a family promotion. Jim Crockett Sr. was a very respected man in the industry. I met him. I was around him. He passed away while I was uh, uh, in, in the first real, real territory that I worked. And his family really were not all that directly involved in the business. The first one that stepped in after he passed was actually the, the daughter's husband. And that relationship went went uh, real bad along the way, and he fell in disfavor. And then that's when the sons became more actively involved. So it was a it, it, w it was a family business, but rooted in Charlotte. When TBS was giving exposure nationally, I I know that Jimmy felt like. To grow, he needed to to break out of of that cocoon of comfort in in the Carolinas, Charlotte in particular, and so that was 
was probably a big factor in making the move to buy Watts organization, which in hindsight uh, really wasn't a, a good move. And what did he buy? Again, yeah, that's, that, that's true. But I think it was part of Jimmy wanting to say, okay, this is my opportunity to now take a big step out of Charlotte. He told us a year before we moved, I'm going to move everybody, I'm going to move my key people to Dallas. Mm -hmm. The rest of the family probably wants to stay here. That's okay because this needs to be run too. But he wanted to grow and he wanted to, to expand. So it would not surprise me that he not only talked to the Von Erichs, but probably a lot of other people as part of, if nothing more than an, an exploratory conversation about where else he could possibly go. Let's have some fun with this one on this broadcast the commercial for the Four Horsemen Top Performance System Vitamins makes its debut. Yes. I want the whole story. <laughs> Give it to me. The whole story is, and I don't know where the product came from, but um, <laughs> it's like it, any kind of merchandising and marketing was in its infants, infancy at that point. We did finally end up with a few t-shirts and a few bandanas. And if I ever received a check for anything, it, I, I think I would have remembered if I got a check. And I don't remember. It just never got that far. And there was a problem that later became a legal thing with the guy that was uh, in charge of the merchandising. And, and again, we. We didn't realize as talent, we were old school. It was the live event and pouring everything into that and the fact that there may be some merchandise. It was nice to have somebody wearing a t-shirt and, and see your picture of the logo on it, but you didn't really think in terms of where that could go and the dollars that could eventually be involved. And really that's where Vince, uh, you know, eventually set the standard and those early toy deals, there were guys working up there, like Iron Cheek, I think, that made more money one year selling action figures yeah. than he did, you know, in, in ring action. So uh, Vince had the vision of, of, of what that could be. We were just getting, you know, like going to Baskin Robbins and give me a spoon, let me taste that one. Oh, that tastes good. Let me that. And but vitamins? Vitamins. Well, I know that. Where how that came up, I don't know. And Who's the company that's manufacturing? It, it wasn't the Crockett's thing. It was an outside deal, right? You no. Know? And probably if somebody came in and was the first one that had the initiative to come in and say, well, here's a product. Oh, wow, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Because they didn't have anything. Right. They had nothing else. And... You know, Flair was a, a power lifter and a bodybuilder, and Luger certainly had the athletic look. Not that Arn and Tully, uh, I don't even account myself in that equation. Well, you were in the ad. Yeah. So well, here I, I was am in the ad, but I could say, you know, after a tough night building up the one arm, right. and uh, you wake up the next morning, I need something to put those vitamins back in my body so I can go another day. But here I walk into this locker room with my big new vitamin company, and there's Sting, and there's Lex, and there's Steve Williams, or whoever. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the horseman for this endorsement. It's kind of odd. It, it is in one sense, but when you look at 25 years later, who is the, is the and, I, and I'm, not, this is, I, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, from that era, who, who do people talk more about? Agreed. Do they talk that much about Sting? Do they talk about, that much about some of the other guys that maybe fit that image of that you could say, well, this person would be a good spokesman for any kind of a health food product? Hey, we were it. Take the vitamin, it teaches you how to hook the tights. That's it. Um, it gives me the strength to take my shoe, shoe off. Shoe, exactly. Yes, now you That's get it. That's what it teaches yeah. you. I think we eventually wanted to get to, uh, to having Barry. Okay. It, I, I, think we've, I think the feeling, without talking about, oh, I remember this specific conversation, but I think we went about as far as we, we could with Lex. 
and then we thought we'd get more mileage out of uh, Bump and Lex over to the other side and boy you look at Barry and everything that, that he brings to the table to ease him into that spot is like wow if you had a magic wand and, and could just go down the line and pick people uh, it would have been a no brainer to pick Barry Windham in there. Now, I'm often asked with regard to the horsemen, my favorite, what were my favorite groups. And I always say that certainly the original horsemen because of Ole, because they were the first. They, that, that's what launched the whole thing and it was a, again, something that the fans picked up on. It uh, wasn't something that was planned out. With Luger, it was Luger becoming available. It was easy to move Ole out, which created a fresh opponent across the ring. And we were able to take Luger and kind of surround him with people with experience. And based on the success of the horsemen at that point, really get a lot of, a lot of mileage out of it. And then it, it was easy to get Luger out of the picture, which again created something, somebody fresh on the other side. And to put Barry in there gave us a new look. So in answering that question, I say the original horsemen will always be special because they were the first. But in terms of in-ring product, that third generation with Barry Wyndham was as good as it, it could get. I don't know that, I mean, Flair is Flair. Tully and Arn were a great, great tag team combination. I think Arn doesn't get enough recognition for his skills as an individual. He was, he was, he was a great singles wrestler too. But Tully was a a really great singles wrestler and could have made made it on his own, but he and Arn just something about them complement each other. Barry as a sing Barry, I you know, could have been a world champion. He could do anything and everything. He had the size, he had the youthful good looks, the, the athleticism. So that group, I I would say, gave us uh, the ability to virtually accomplish anything. First of all, how much did you love being in that cage? Not a whole lot. Do you know what the things that go through your mind? You run and go to the bathroom right before, um. and then you think, if you're there at ringside, and you're there for that same length of match, you don't think in terms of those terms. You know, if I absolutely had to, I could leave and come back, crawl under the ring, do something, but you're now in a situation where you can do absolutely nothing. 45 minutes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing, too, when I'm at ringside, one of my things that I felt contributed to whatever level of success I achieved was I always was into the match as if I was an extension of somebody in the first row now moved right up dead against ringside. That um, if my guy was, was, was hurting, oh, if he hit, I felt the impact. And I'm, I'm emotionally kind of a sounding board or a reactionary to everything that's happening in the ring. And my thinking is if this person over here bought a ticket to see it, and I want them interested. If I'm not interested, how can I expect them to be interested enough that, that they'll come back again next time? By the same token, you know, all of a sudden my guy turns it around. Yeah! I'm the, I, again, same thing on the other side. Now when you're up there, you, yeah. you're so far from it that you don't, you can't be a factor. You can to a degree, but it's not the same. And the first couple of minutes, you, you, you know, you get some of this and then they forget that you're there, yeah. <laughs> which is okay. Because that's what I guess it was designed to do. And the focus comes in the ring. And when you have a guy like Ric Flair leading a guy like Sting, you know, you, you end up with uh, something pretty damn yeah. good. Firstly, Talk to me about WrestleMania as an event. What are your obligations to the company leading up to the event? I know there's a big to-do the day before where you're meeting fans, so you're in Atlantic City for a period of time and you're doing what? Yeah, well, they had, now it's in, involved in the whole uh, Fan Fest week. Uh, this past uh, year we were in uh, Houston. 
whole week long event. It was me and Sergeant Slaughter doing a lot of the events together, autograph sessions, uh, question and answers, interviews, stuff like that. But just I think the actually the NFL kind of took it from us, where they they you know just make it a whole deal. They have that the WrestleMania, the the Road to WrestleMania show. Just great marketing, and you know hopefully uh, at, at at last year's WrestleMania they bring a lot of the old timers in. And it gives us a you know another payday and another chance to be around the show because it is the big time. I mean you know no matter what, the WWE even now so more than back in the day. You know that's why I was lucky to have the second run. I've lived every old timer's dream. I had my run in the 80s and early 90s and whatever, and then I did the Indies and went overseas a lot. And all of a sudden, boom! I got a chance to come back. But this time I, I got a chance to come back and enjoy it. You know, back in the old days, we're all, hey, let's go, next town, 100 miles an hour party, you know. Now I'd get off the interstate, I'd drive, drive through the west, out through California, Utah, I mean, and got a chance to really enjoy it and appreciate the, the business. So I, it was a great opportunity for me to have this uh, second run. With WrestleMania, are you, is it a payday for each of these appearances that you're doing leading up well, to Well, I think they just glom it all together. You know, they, they you know, Johnny Ace or John Laronitis know. You know, you got to, um, you know, the, how many times, how many appearances do you do? And it's such a huge deal. It's, uh, it's amazing. And it, it's, you know, that's why I always, uh, Wade Box, a baseball player, is a, a good friend of mine. I do a lot with the NFL Players Association. And I always, I bust those guys' chops. I'm like, world champions? You guys been to Australia, Japan, Europe? I mean, the WWE is, this past year I was down in Santiago, Chile, and Lima, Peru. I mean, and you know what ringside seats cost in Lima, Peru? Two chickens and a goat. And it's like, ah, ringside! <laughs> no. But it, it's a phenomenon, and it's, it's great to be part of it. But also you realize you're not part of the team. You're the equipment. It's the old North Dallas 40 deal. They're the team, Vince and Linda and Shane and uh, Stephanie. That's the team. Mm. We're the equipment. But welcome to the real world. Mm. But even back then in the 80s, WrestleMania was a major payday. Yeah, being on that card meant a lot. Being on that and, and being actually on the show, in a way. Yeah. not only been to just enhance just the rub you have off uh, WWE. You know, I just the last thing I think I'd done on cam with WWE was up in Calgary uh, when Sergeant Slaughter was doing the, the the blast in Canada, and they did the deal where like, okay, we're going to bring out the best there was, the best there is, the best there ever will be, and, you know, and so they're all waiting for Brett, and they're like, go, Duggan. I come out with the American flag, and they're like, hi. Ah. <laughs> you know, it's, but that's, that's Vince. He's, he takes it to the edge and pushes the envelope all the time. The venue, the, the, uh, the big convention center in Atlantic City where they did the, the, um, the WrestleMania <coughs> floor the, under the Trump Plaza banner, I've heard the building criticized by some of the talent that was there because, I don't know if it was just the, it's been attributed to, one, the acoustics, but also the fact that the nature of Atlantic City, a lot of comps were given to gamblers and maybe not really wrestling fans. But it was, the building wasn't as hot as some of the other. Do you remember any of this to be true? Jeez, my match was hot. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Maybe turn it up a little bit. You know, I got, I got to talk about turning stuff up. WCW, you know, uh, Eric Bischoff, they're trying to push me out of my contract. And because uh, I'm one of the last of the old timers, they're bringing all the young kids, and they're like, you know, I got to get rid of Duggan. And they're like, uh, well, first they, they made me the janitor of the WCW. And they're like, you know, I've got to fly up to Atlanta. And, Go to the CNN Tower. Lot of another Larry King story, just real quick. We're in the CNN Tower, me and Nobbs and Sags are going up in the elevator, and Larry gets on the on the uh, on the elevator with us, and Nobbs goes, "How's your ratings, Larry?" <laughs> of course, if we kill you know w, the rating wrestling ratings. O'Reilly, King, all those guys, we blow them away. Uh, but where I was going with that story? Oh, so, so I go up to Atlanta. And they're like, we're going to make you the janitor of the WCW. I'm like, well, that's all right. You know, we're going to have to wear a janitor suit. Like, oh, that's okay. You're going to have to clean toilets. I said, well, I've cleaned toilets before. And so and so the deal is, I got to clean Russo's toilet with a toothbrush. And they're like, okay, actually, so and so we're we get ready to write. We get five, four. I take my soda, I pour my diet coke, and some of this water's all. And then so they three, two, one. I get in there and splash. I got the water going everywhere. I got my head in the toilet. Hey, I'm cleaning the toilets, baby. Cleaning the toilets. Doesn't matter what you do with me. Give me my camera time. I'll get my ass over. So the 
the whole deal, because they had Thunder, they had Thursday Night Thunder, mm -hmm. Monday Night Nitro, and we had our Saturday Night, Saturday night yeah. show. And Jimmy Hart was the producer of that show. And we did this stuff for the janitor. We had ratings of the Thursday Night Show with a fifth of the budget. And then, uh, so the, the janitor deal was, was, was working. So they fly back up to Atlanta, Hacksaw, we're going to turn you against America. They're going to turn me, I'm thinking, geez, Iraq, Iran, where are we going with this? And they're like, you're joining Team Canada. I'm going to go, well, got a lot of heat with Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, but I'll tell you, what, good, the good thing about it was I, I cut my hair and shaved my beard. So guys that I've known my whole career, didn't have a clue who I was. Really? Nobody's ever seen me. I walked in and they didn't know. They thought I was like one of the commissioners from the State Athletic Commission. Yeah. And I'm walking in and going, how about that dumb guy? <laughs> <laughs> that was, it was great. So anyway, they stick me up with, uh, with uh, Major Guns, uh, Lance Storm, uh, Bill DeMont, uh, General Erection or whatever deal. So they got me in there with Lance. And Lance is a great wrestling talent, but he's on the microphone going, May I please have everyone's attention? And I'm behind him being axed. Shut your mouth! Sit on over there, you know? And they're like, fly back to land. And they're like, actually, you're, you're taking away from the kid, you know? You gotta turn it down a little bit. Let's turn my shit down. Let him turn his stuff up, you know? But that's where I got that. And turn. thus, you maybe would have had some more heat in Atlantic City. If you turn it up, whoever told us. That's us. right, yes. Yeah, so if you can't told. get the crowd Valentine. going, brother, turn it up. Valentine told us that. That's what. Well, you've seen Greg's match, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg's a buddy of mine. <laughs>
your usually. jobs? Yeah, usually, I think. And that's one thing that's like Orlando and Disney World. If you have kids, sooner or later you're going to come to a WWE event. So you meet movie stars, you meet politicians, you meet athletes, I mean, you meet all kinds of folks. And the only serious trouble I had was this, at this past WrestleMania. We're at, uh, at the hotel and the night before uh, Russell's Saturday night show Sunday. And, uh, you know, all us old timers are down in the, in the lobby having a good time. And I, was, I went upstairs to check on my daughters. And uh, as I was left them, I'm, you know, got my glasses off. I got a couple of cocktails in me. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm walking down the hallway. And I see three guys walking towards me. So I figure, well, you know, the, the top few floors of the hotel are all secure, so there's got to be WWE people. You know? So I'm walking, so I move over to the right, and two other guys move over to the right, but the one guy kind of bows up, and he's walking by me, you know. And I brush by him as we brush by. I go, you got enough room there, buddy? And he spins around, he goes, what you say to me? <laughs> I turn around, I say, well, you got enough room there, you asshole. Said, you don't talk to me that way, so I'm trying to focus. It's Mickey Rourke, you know. And so I'm trying to focus in on the guy. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. So I, yeah, he's spitting mad. So I, I do my standard line with short guys. I go, well, stand up when you're talking to me. Why, well, yo, son? And the other two guys uh, was uh, Shamrock's brother Thanks. and another Ultimate Fire kid. He brought with him in case he had trouble, right? Uh, and they were very cool. They're like, come on, Axel, come on, Mickey, knock it off. We don't need no trouble in the hallway and stuff. So I went back downstairs, so we have the WrestleMania, they have the show, and of course we have a big after party, and Kid Rock was there, and Kid was great, played the bongos, took pictures with my wife and kids, it was very personal. And uh, Steve Lombardi comes up to me, and he goes, uh, Axel, I says, go over there, schmooze stuff over with Mickey from last night, you know? And, you know, so well, if I get over there, I'll, you know, I'll say something to him. And so about an hour later, Lombardi comes up and goes, you're right, Axel, that Mickey work is an ass. <laughs> he, he did have a, uh, kind of a bad attitude. But usually, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, like I said, if, if they have kids, Michael Douglas, they're going to come to the wrestling. And a uh, majority of them are respectful of the business because I think people in entertainment appreciate what we do. Yeah. Good. That's good to hear. Lombardi's been there a long time, hasn't he, boy? Lombardi's been there a long time. Any, yeah, theory, he's a any, theories, on that? any theories on that? Um, he works hard. <laughs> Fresh from Connecticut, <laughs> make it known. Um, well, you know, back in the day, that that was much more prevalent. You know, the the whole bisexual gay deal in wrestling, and of course, it was common knowledge. The number two man in the WWE for ever, Pat Patterson, was married to Louie, and they lived as husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's showbiz. That but nobody ever hit on me. I don't understand, you know. I've got feelings, too. <laughs> Billy Jack took a finger in the ass in the shower, apparently. Jeez, uh, did he get the belt? <laughs> so it took more than a finger. <laughs> oh, no, it's over for Billy. Um, well, Billy was another one of those guys on the edge. Yes. I think you know, everybody appreciated Randy for what Randy is and does. I mean, he is macho man. Uh, you know, he has no longer nothing to do with Poffo. He, he is macho man. So you got to kind of, I don't know if you respect that or not, but I mean, you knew he was 100% going in that direction. Mm -hmm. I always got along with Randy. I, I got along good with him. Uh, until towards the end, after Spider-Man, I, I saw him in Philadelphia. I'm going to Atlantic City. I'm waiting for my bags to come off the... Uh, the carousel in, in Philly Airport, and I look, and I'm like, here comes Macho down the elevator. I'm like, it was not that long ago, just recently after Spider, I'm like, hey, Macho, brother, hey, how you doing? He goes, well, hello, Jim. I'm like, well, hello, Randy, you know, stand up again, you know, short guy, you know. <laughs> not as warm as he could have been to you. Perhaps. No, it's considering the past. You know, there's something about wrestling, which I was reading in the USA Today, uh, happens with movie stars a lot. You spend a certain length of time with guys or, or women or, or uh, co-workers that you spend a lot of time with for a short period of time and become close and then go separate ways to different territories and never see each other. Uh, a good story, uh, my three best uh, friends, two of them, Terry Gordy and Steve Williams were tag team champions in Japan and had a great career in Japan. 
Uh, Doc and I lived together in Louisiana. Gordy and I lived together in Georgia. We were all best friends, but the three of us were never together at the same time. Hmm. Yeah, in all those years. Is there trepidation over giving away what we wanted the fans to either buy pay-per-view or go to an arena to see now? That is always a very delicate balance. Um, the philosophy in the industry always was that television, even, even back in the territory days, is basically an infomercial for your, for your product. Um, you only had, in those days, a barter a thing where you would have four minutes of the commercial time, uh, and most promotion companies produced the program, gave it to the television station. Television station now had a finished product to put on air, sold the advertising, but you maintained four minutes, and that those, those commercials were where you promoted the live event in the, in the specific towns. It was, a, it was a great, great formula. But it also allowed the announcers during the commentary to talk about things that were somewhat generic that in oftentimes were commercial in nature. So it was, uh, the, the balance was you want ratings, you want eyeballs, you want people to see your product so that hopefully you can entice them to come out and buy a ticket to, to see the live event. But you don't want to give them so much that they're content to sit at home and watch and don't feel compelled to mm -hmm. come buy a ticket. After WrestleMania, we used to have a little break, I think. And, uh, it was funny because I think it was right after one of the WrestleManias, Undertaker's wife, Rotunda's wife, and my wife all had kids nine months after the deal. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> it was actually, uh, you know, that's, that's my wife and I, like I said, we've been together for almost 26 years now, and we put off having children until later on because I was working so much. And finally, when she said the, uh, you know, time to have kids, she's, you know, 10 years younger than me, I said, well, you know, we've got to start trying to have kids. And we went through, you know, for, you know, I was on the road all the time. And so she got, you know, when we finally got together, it was, she didn't have, we didn't try it forever. You know, I told her, I said, don't worry, it'd be like having a pizza with time, right, boom, boom, we'll have a kid. Nothing happened. Three months, six months, nine months. I'm like, oh my gosh. And uh, so she, you know, that's the old joke. She'd call me, she goes, the time's right, the temperature's perfect, everything's perfect. I'm like, that's great, honey, I'm in Indianapolis, you know. <laughs> find somebody looks a little bit like me anyway. <laughs> you did Europe, um, I, usually after WrestleMania too. Uh, also, I mean, not WrestleMania too, WrestleMania also. You usually do a foreign tour? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, we did a, uh, well, that was SummerSlam, I'm trying to think. But we, we did go, I don't think it was after every WrestleMania. Okay, where were you here? Okay, 88, you were in Italy and Switzerland. How about that? No, I, I didn't go to Switzerland. Didn't go to Switzerland. You went to Italy, though, Italy, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. In a, uh, Hala Tassardi. There you go. Let me see. 20 wrestlers on a transcontinental flight. I'm sure it's very quiet. Yeah. Nobody lot, gets out of line. A lot happens on the flights, you know, especially in, and back in the day, everybody would take sleeping pills. You know, drugs were prevalent because you were working an awful lot. Downers, uppers, you need some, you know, you need some sleeping pills. But I'm not, this trip in particular, I, I don't remember, but uh, many I do. Uh, just recently, well, not recently, but recently than this, uh, we're flying over to Europe and Flair gets on the plane, we're all in first class or buzz, business class and, and he's like, I got a, a big day tomorrow. He stands up in front of everybody, everybody's sitting in the plane, I got a big day, I don't want nobody screwing around, I got to get some sleep on the plane, no no ribs, no nothing. So all right, all right, all right. everybody goes to sleep. So everybody takes us, <laughs> wake up in Europe, I'm like, He's half my eyebrows gone. <laughs> Flair wakes up, half his eyebrows gone. Everybody's waking up, their eyebrows are gone. Knobs comes like this. Look, they got me too. Both of his eyebrows are completely, you, a woman couldn't shave them. So Knobs, to sell the ribs so much, he clipped everybody, but then he shaved his own completely <laughs> to take the heat off himself. That's commitment man. to that's, a rib. Boy. That's commitment to a rib. 
But we got we got him back though. We're coming back from uh, the West Coast to the East Coast on a red eye. We're all settled in, in, in domestic now, so we're all in first class. We're all getting settled, just ready to sleep. Door just before it closes, and up. Ah, hey, how you doing? Business been in the back of the head. Hey, it screws with everybody on the plane, right? Take the rainbow stew. As Kurt used to call it. <laughs> Down he goes. Now the whole plane is like, let's get him. So, of course, we painted all his fingernails, tied cans to his shoes. Everybody donated their blankets, so they covered him in blankets. And, you know, Nobbs is a big guy anyway. And then the Steve Kern gets lipstick and puts a big heart on one cheek and writes, I'm a dick on his forehead. <laughs> so <laughs> we land in Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> and Nobbs is still out, so me and Sags got him underneath the arms. We're going to the airport, <laughs> dragging the shoe. People are looking at me. Like, I'm a dick on his forehead, right? So we go down the escalator. And Tony, his wife, is a beautiful uh, young lady, and she's all dressed up. This is before they got married, you know. And she's like, "Oh, Brian," she sees the big heart. And it gets closer. I'm a dick. She's a cool. They have a big pull apart in the airport, man. But Nobbs and Tony are another one that's been together for a long time. Uh, like I said, very few. Hogan, right. Linda are gone. I think of Piper, uh, Tito, very few of us. Uh, right. And uh, that's the deal. That the, Speaking of going back a little bit, uh, Mickey Wark and the wrestler movie. You know, everybody thinks we're all degenerates. We're all living in trailer parks. We're all been through three or four wives. There's a lot of guys that are successful in the business. Saved their money, put their kids through school, been with their wives for years, and lived normal lives. But nobody ever wants to hear about that. Everybody wants to hear about the train wreck, the drug addicts, the people that, you know, do all kinds of horrible, nasty things, which a lot of us have done over the years. But there's also a lot of success stories. That don't sell tickets. You're not kidding, you happy brother. guys? Yeah, you ain't kidding, but it's true life. You know, when people say, well, Hacksaw, you haven't been that successful in wrestling. I say, are you kidding? I save more money than 99% of the guys. I've moved my wife for so many years. My kids go through are, uh, in sports and going through school. Yeah, I've been successful in this business. <laughs>
and his father was going to pay him a penny a rock to move on. He worked all day and moved all these rocks. And when he gave him the money, it was just a couple of bucks. <laughs> and he realized Jack was Jack was a man's man and raised his his uh, you know had to raise his kids the right the right way. And then Barry's last thing was yeah, and I got a. Uh, I got an ass whooping for it too, you know, because I, you know, looked at him crossways or, or made a comment. So, uh, but uh, he loves his father, and, and I could see that uh, the black glove, whether it was his idea, Dusty's idea, or something where the, the two of them, ah, you know, would it be great, you know, and, and whether it happened spontaneously, uh, certainly was a tribute to Blackjack, who, in his own right, was a great, great talent. You could feel the pressure rack, ratchet it up. Of course, we do live TV every week. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, in the old days, NYPD Blue, they're like, we're doing a live show. I'm like, big deal, we do it every week, brother. So you get used to pressure. I, I mean, I was used to my deal right before you go out, I'd be like, I don't have a two by four. Where's my two by four? They're like, get the line, it's two by four, two by four, everybody get that. Oh, here it is, fellas, calm down. You know, I like to rib with the guy, because the people were wound very tight at live TV. But were you given anything to say, or was it still up to you to come up with your promos for I that? I pretty much believe they would give you uh, points, okay. but I don't know if they would give you exact verbiage. And that's, you know, when I first came back up to the WWE, I'd have some young guy come up, Brian, one of these young kids, and say, Hacksaw, this is your verbiage for your interview. I'm like, how's some young punk kid going to tell Hacksaw and Jim Duggan how to cut his interview? They were like, this is what we want you to say. And I'm like, well. Okay, send me my check. <laughs> uh, on that show, you defeat Hercules. And uh, there's another, uh, someone who's passed. Uh, yeah, a lot of your guys. relationship with Ray like? I, I knew Ray pretty well. I knew Ray back in the Mid-South, uh, Louisiana. And uh, Ray was always, always a troubled soul. I mean, he always he had a lot of trouble, a lot of fights, a lot of uh, the best, uh, domestic abuse. He had a lot of things going on in his life, but you know, I liked Ray. He was he was a he was a fun guy. He was a lot a lot of food over in Europe, and uh, he was obviously with a transvestite. And the, the bouncer comes over and he goes, "Your your friend is with a man." <laughs> I don't think he cares. <laughs> that was just in Europe. <laughs> what happens in Europe yeah, yeah. stays in Europe. And they always can tell. You know, it's you go man. to the uh, the beaches in Europe. The guys are like this. They go, he must be an American. Everybody's food over there anyway, you know. What's the relationship there? Is she, is she hired as a result of some kind of I don't know how she got relationship with the McMahon, yeah, so. I don't know how. I think, you know, Vince has a loyalty to wrestling families. Uh, I mean, he, he appreciates, you know, I mean, putting... Uh, Bill Watson, the Hall of Fame, stuff like that. I think he just appreciates people in the business and tries to help them out. And, um, you know, Mike added to the show. She was a beautiful young lady, you know, in the tuxedo deal. <laughs> I'll tell you a good Mike McGurk story. Uh, I was wrestling an earthquake and Jimmy Hart was his manager and Mike's the ring announcer. So we're battling wherever out Midwest somewhere. And when I'm in the ring, I throw the two by four up as high as I can and I get out from behind, underneath it, and I catch it like this. And on camera, knock on wood, I've never missed a two by four on camera. But now when I roll outside the ring, again, we we're talking about the barricades, you got the barricade there, you got the ring there, you only got this much room. Mm -hmm. I would throw the board straight up, and I'd catch it with both hands, because I didn't want to, you know. But as I rolled out of the ring, earthquakes kicked the hell out of me, it knocks me out of the ring, I roll out, and I throw my two, I'm right next to Mike, I throw my, my two by four up, I look down at Mike, I go, Great shoes, Mike. And I turn back around, boom, the board is me in the head. Down I go. I'm juiced big time, you know. I roll back in the ring, Jimmy Hart's freaking out. He's bleeding, baby. He's bleeding. He's bleeding, baby. He's bleeding. <laughs> big earthquake finishes me, whatever the deal is, you know. So I come back to the dressing room, and the paramedics all come running up. They're like, what happened? What happened? What happened? I'm like, it was on the two by four. They're like, what? I said, it was over the two by four. Is that the yeah. only time you clocked yourself with that thing? Yeah, really. Wow. You know, yeah, yeah. 
surprisingly. That alone and, is an accomplishment. I tell you, the because sometimes you can't get out of the house. Sometimes you get uh, so pumped up, you know, because you can't help it. You know, people say, "How you get fired up? How you get fired up? You got in front of thousands of people. Everybody's screaming and howling. You can't help but get fired up." So that sometimes I throw the board up. I mean, so high. I'm like, "Oh Jesus, I'll never catch it." Oh, and that's why. I think uh, people kind of appreciate my deal because it's like, I'm like, oh, they're really happy I caught it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's part of my appeal with the people is they see that I appreciate what they do for me and that I'm having a good time in the ring. Well, they were always fun for the fans, but that bell hurt. Dusty loved doing that, and and, <laughs> and invariably, you, you you took more than you gave, um, and I had it like I say I had a, I had a number of them with him. It just was another way to have another confrontation, but you know basically dressed in a way that uh, it didn't look like the same match all over again. What would he come to you and say? Now here's the Booker and the person you're working with giving you the finish. I'm going to hit you with the bell, you're going to go down, blah, 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 that's it? Well, I, I was, had been in the business long enough and was smart enough to know the finish when it was advertised. <laughs> so it's not like I am coming uh, to the arena waiting for somebody to come tell me, thinking that it's going to be anything other than what it was. What were the plans with Dick Murdoch as the masked man? Is this supposed to be something more than, was this supposed to have legs? I don't know. Uh, you have to remember that when Dusty first broke into the business, my first exposure to Dusty was uh, in Detroit and wrestling a television match against the Texas Outlaws, which were Dusty Rhodes and Dirty Dick Murdoch. Mm. So they started together as mm. a team. Uh, Dusty went to West Texas uh, State. Dickie lived there. Uh, went to alumni functions, but never attended. I was going to say, is it true that he just walked onto campus yeah. and was able to play football? Well, I don't know that he was able to play football, but he was, he was uh, somehow, somebody I think snuck his name into the alumni association. But, it, it, you know, <laughs> I think if he was there, he was there for one of these. You know, the, the, you know I mean, it was a beer. I think it would be fair for a little tribute to Dick for all the, if nothing else, the stories he's given everyone in the business. Dickie was so talented. And there are people that think, you know, he, he would have been a great world champion. But Dickie didn't like to go to the gym either. He was a naturally brute, strong country boy, had a little tummy on him, and which was deceiving. And he made everything that he did in the ring look so easy. And he had a lot of fun. Mm. And he was fun to be in with, though his work was very solid. But the promoters sometimes could see that he was having fun and, and thought that, there, that he wasn't serious enough, mm. which was unfortunate because he, he was. And I'm, I'm a little over six foot tall, probably at that time maybe 230 pounds soaking wet. And Dickie was probably... You know, six, six, seven, big guy, 275, close to 300 pounds. And I'm the heel, and he's the baby face. You would think the roles would be reversed. Mm. And he made me, in these small towns like Amarillo, he was one of them. Mm. But I didn't go to the bars. I stayed, I stayed, I didn't go out and put myself in positions of vulnerability. And that's right where, where, uh, where he went all the time. He was the and center. The, and of the that. fans yeah. would say, they would look at that picture and say, he can't be all that tough. Oh, yeah? He kicked my ass. You saying, I'm not tough? Boom! <laughs> and so he would get into fights every night in the bars and he would kick the daylights out of everybody. And they, they knew how tough he was in the town. And because he said I was tough, well, I must be tough. I don't know, but sometimes you take something that's successful and you don't, you shouldn't mess with it. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Why such yeah. a drastic change? Even if you want to do something a little different because of the babyface run, but uh, that happens sometimes. Some guys just uh, have success, not to say that they didn't pay enough dues to earn that success, but they they have that success and then they have trouble dealing with it, and then they. 
they, they begin to believe that it's something beyond just whatever made them successful in that look and they drastically change their look and everything changes and they can't understand why. Joe LaDuke. Joe LaDuke, jumping Joe. I remember Joe LaDuke. He was a, a tough man. I met Joe actually down in the Pensacola Territory working for Fuller's, and he was a, a rough man. I believe he was uh, murdered. Was that true? I did not know that. Yeah, I believe he was beat to death up in Montreal. Same people that got Dino Bravo. Oh, were they all involved in that stuff together? Yeah. Um, Joe was here for, uh, I guess, a few months and then gone. Uh, what was the story there? Well, I think uh, now as time moves on in the company, it's becoming more and more corporate. I mean, the outlaw days were, uh, you know, the drinking and partying and fighting and all that stuff was kind of going out of style and there's having a more corporate image and, they, and uh, I don't think Joe really fit into that. That's why I think guys like uh, Big Sid, uh, Sid Vicious, Hogan, Flair, you know, those kind of guys that, that fit the world champion type look, a lot of blonde hair, nice white mm -hmm. teeth, good bodies, and I, I don't think Joe blended to that. The matinee, matinee idols, Joe LaDuke, Butcher Vachon, right. yeah, yeah. Mad Dog Back Vachon. To, but the last guys you'd want to mess with. Why would a balloon payment structure be in? What does that mean? Um, the traditional WWF contract had a very, very small guarantee written into it. WCW. W, no, I'm talking about oh, the, WWF. Because oh, okay. that's where contracts basically started from. Okay. And then where they had the rights to a talent and basically all it said was uh, uh, we'll get, we guarantee you like uh, 15 bookings a year, uh, you know, for, and, and, and not even if the, the money was so much per booking, what you were being and what had been sold was opportunity. Mm -hmm. I have this vast empire, this powerful television, and I'm offering you opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, what you do with it is up to you, and if you have success and I will help you be put into positions where you can be successful, then we'll, we'll both share rewards. Jimmy started guaranteeing dollars as a, I, as a way to compete, where at the end of the year, you know that you were gonna make this much. However, on a week to week to week basis, it was paid based on the old formula of when you worked, you got paid, and based on the size of the house, the payment was, and the idea was at the end of the year, if the money that had, you had been made did not come up to what the contract said you were gonna make, then the balloon payment you got a was balloon, there. One big chunk. Was a chunk to, oh, okay. to, to bring you up. It was, uh, it was a different approach, and I think it was a way for Jimmy to hold some talent, but it also, was again uh, this was a pivotal pivotal year where even the whole company just because of some some decisions that were made that that uh, you look back in hindsight were maybe not the best decisions or, or the timing certainly wasn't good uh, you know you purchase airplanes you do things to to make things easier for talent and sometimes some of these decisions and and the other thing that I point out too was again it was the, the structure of the of the original family promotion really never radic radically changed mm -hmm. and there were people that had been there tied to the family for a long long time and there were people that were accustomed to the old mid-atlantic promotion with the uh, uh, with I mean, even at its biggest with Christmas shows and the Charlotte Coliseum, the, the, the ups were only up compared to here, compared to all of a sudden, yeah. you know, where they found themselves. And I don't think that they had 
the infrastructure to be able to deal with the level of success that they enjoyed. And it was okay for a while, but then it eventually caught up with them. And this was the beginning of, of catch up. Those, ca those contracts, yes. yeah. Yep. Were kids allowed in the locker rooms? Was the, the kayfabe stuff kind of phasing out now where kids could run around freely? Well, I think the rest of even, even before the kayfabe, uh, families were always kind of involved. Uh, and you always went out of your way to be nice to someone that's else's family because you know you, one day you would have your family there. And I think even recently, uh, John Cena, who I really respect and admire, I think he does a very good job. He's a good uh, company spokesman. But also, he's, uh, I brought my sister to the show. Took time to walk up to her, said, introduced himself, thank you for coming, just a gentleman. But I think that was always something in wrestling that the guys always did was kind of be acceptive of the other people's families. How serious is this taken by anybody in the room? Well, I, I think everybody kind of just blew it off, to tell you the truth. I mean, it was, it was a good deal on Vince's part, because of, but unless you start testing and finding and suspension, guys are going to do what they're going to do. And steroids were rampant in our business as they were in most uh, major sports. And for, for, I mean, Zahorian, the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission doctor, you know, was giving out the steroids. That was my deal. I, I had to go talk to the FBI at, uh, in New York City. I had to get a lawyer, go down and and, and, and be interviewed by the FBI and everything. And my deal was, hey, I'm a naive young guy. This state athletic commission doctor told me this would make me bigger and stronger. You know, but uh, this was for Zaharian's trial or for McMahon's trial? Uh, I think it was for McMahon's trial. Okay. Yeah. And uh, but you know, the, the steroids were just rampant, and nothing ever, never ever came of it. I never had to testify in court or nothing. Because I, like I said, I never was in on the click, so I wasn't in all the inner workings and stuff. I just do my own deal. You mentioned being gassed up, as you said before. Did you have any negative effects on your body? From well, I'm a cancer survivor. Right, I sure. Had kidney cancer, and I believe, uh, and just with the grace of God and early detection, saved my life. Uh, be almost 12 years ago now that I was diagnosed. But yeah, all that crap I put in my body, not just the steroids, but the booze and the drugs and all that, uh, it took an effect, yeah. How much of those three details are a shoot? We know she was Patty, we know they were married. Was she an old flame of Kevin's? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah. But this is kind of maybe one of the first times we're seeing some shoot stuff being put on television. Uh, risky for the time. Uh, yeah. But uh, Dusty took chances, took risks, went, went to new places, and, and, and Jimmy went, Crockett went with him. And as with anything, some things really work extremely well, some, some don't. Sometimes, well, here's the envelope, well, this, I think this is a great idea, and then all of a sudden you realize, well, no matter what we put in the envelope, how are we going to get out of this? With, you know, and so all of a sudden the envelope just disappears. So that happens. Were you ever told that something important will be happening, somebody's going to be here, some kind of dignitary, at this point or any other in the process of Turner coming in, um, to amp it up, perform differently in any way? I don't know that, that, that there was ever any like private meeting saying, you know, this is our, our future, we're in, we're in trouble. I, I, I think it was probably more of uh, this is uh, a possible direction that that we could go, whether it was perceived more as a safety net at that point, that uh, let's, let's just nurture that relationship, because it went deeper than that. You have to, to go back to uh, when Vince McMahon was, 
was providing the programming on TBS, and Ted says to Vince, well, you know, I'd like to buy into your company, everything that, that I have here, you know, I like to be partners in, and Vince said, well, maybe you can be partners in other things, but you're not going to be partners in this one. The answer is no, and that created a, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a clash between these two highly successful, successful people. So I think in the back of Ted's mind was he probably was very receptive to the idea of, of now owning what was a very successful major wrestling promotion, number one. And number two, the same company that he was buying was also providing programming to his network that was doing very well rating-wise. So I would have thought you go through the due diligence process, but in the end, I think Ted, in his own mind, wanted to make sure everything was okay, but he liked the idea of being able to own a company that was providing programming and at the same time be able to make that call to Vince and say, guess what, Vince? I'm, I'm, I'm in the wrestling business, too. That was actually the call, wasn't it? That I'm was the, the call, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, that may be true, but I'm still going to kick your ass. Um, th this, was this match a rib on the entire uh, city of Denver? Or anyone who, <laughs> any of the 8,500 that were in attendance that night? Well, that's a good house, 8,500. But, uh, no, I think fans... Nowadays, I think you talk about marks earlier. I think the biggest marks in wrestling now are the guys in the dressing room. The boy, if you're not out there drop kicking and head scissors and all these fancy damn wrestling moves, then you're not wrestling. But you go out there and you see these guys flying around the crowds like this. You know? And you go out and you give them a ho, and the whole place stands up and goes, ho, and I go, USA, and they go, USA. And George would be out there going, mine, and Mr. Fuji be throwing the salt. It's entertainment, and and though you may say on paper that looks horrible, I bet they had the 8,500 people standing up screaming. Was there a natural distrust of outside media coming into the locker room? Sure. Well, I think everybody, in even in today's media, they try to expose wrestling. Jeez. As sports entertainment, you know, I mean, come on, what kind of exposure do you want? But I, I and then what I, I love is the local news media, you know, we'll be at Nassau County Coliseum with 20,000 people jammed in that building. They'll be like, well, we're going to cut to the remote at Joe down at the Nassau County Coliseum. We're wrestling. And he's like, hey, we're here at the wrestling show. And then, well, let's cut the women's volleyball. And, you know, they got 32 people in the stands, you know. Like it or don't like it, the media should report on our sport or our entertainment business as it is. If a certain part of your population wants to watch that, then report on it. Don't put in always to try to elevate themselves above. Oh, I'm not a wrestling fan. <laughs> but those 20,000 people down there, you know, I, I never in, uh, understood that. Is of course uh, Bruce Pritchard, um, who goes on to have a very lengthy uh, uh, stay with the company behind the camera. How does one make that transition, do you think, successfully to a there's, producer role or something? I don't think there's any set formula. You know, Bruce Beck uh, for um, Paul Bosch in Houston wrestling used to go get coffee for me and DiBiase and the boys. I mean, and he worked his way through and. It's like, what, it, what does it take to be a wrestler? There's no set formula. It doesn't take a certain body type. It doesn't take a certain character type. It just has to be in the right place at the right time and, and put up with the right kind of BS. And, and Bruce was successful at it. Did the women's title have in the 
company at this time? Was this something that was taken seriously? Well, I don't think as much as it is now. I think in the day, lady wrestlers were lady wrestlers. Scary Sherry, Velvet McIntyre, uh, Lilani Kai. They were tough, struff, tough women. You wouldn't want to slap one of them because you get a live round back. Now the trend is towards young, beautiful divas. They're all Playboy Playmates and stuff. But, you know, who's to argue with success? And, and that seems to be a, a big part of the show now. Even though I think even now the pendulum's swinging back to less TNA and uh, obscene gestures and profanity and more family type entertainment. Probably be a lot better to walk into the shower, wrong shower by accident today than maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're not kidding. Dude. Where did this come from? I have no idea. I don't know if it was George's deal or Vince's deal. Because, you know, Vince could be quite a ripper. Terry Taylor, who was a we'll very there. GQ guy, you know, to put the red rooster on him, was just a, a shot to Terry Taylor. And if, if Terry went with that full blown, he could have gone with it. But he would hit, did it half butt. Where I think, I don't know if they gave that to George or not, you know, but he, mine. And I think he did, did some merchandise stuff. Oh, yeah. What, what was it, a bear? It wasn't a bear. It was some kind of animal. It's it was a nondescript animal. I always envisioned McMahon inherited a warehouse of 10,000 fucking animals <laughs> and had to do something what with kind it. Of animals? Fucking animals. <laughs> Stuffed animals. And he put the green tongue on it and, and made it mine. Now... I know your friends, but a bit of an odd choice. Never one really that was put in the center spotlight much. Mm -hmm. It was tag guy, you know, tag team guy. Mm -hmm. uh, not one that ever was on the stick alone without Bobby. Couldn't talk too well. It's, what of course, you he's, you know, from Tonga. So mm -hmm. English was not his first language. Mm -hmm. But um, a legit tough guy. Yeah. Yeah, probably one of the toughest guys in our business. You must have a story. I was going to ask you for one. Everyone's got a haku and a bar story. Haku, well, he, he would attract a lot of guys, you know, that would want to fight, you know, and Haku he used to drink whiskey, but he, Haku, actually, I, I see him, I, I do a lot of golf tournaments in Florida, and he lives in Orlando now and is, uh, has a nice life down there, but uh, he would grab the guy, he, for, he grabbed me, he goes, first I kill you, then I eat you, and I'd say, you know about Three generations ago, brother, <laughs> you'd never be on a stick down there. And it's not a stretch for this guy to eat you. <laughs> Is this an attendance thing? Is just a logistical thing? Did you have problems with rain in years prior? Why the decisions to go inside for what was known? And the reason it was unique was it was the big summer outdoor thing. I think a lesson was learned with the bashes the prior year that, um, especially with the bringing in largely country acts and combining you know music with wrestling, uh, a lot of risks involved, a lot of potential problems, and you and they're more expensive to run, and, and I think it was just a decision that. Looking back at, at the whole of the whole summer before with all the shows, they were perceived as successful, but in terms of dollars, maybe not as successful as you you had hoped they would be. So we've we've learned a lesson from that. Let's let's be a little bit smarter smarter this year. And again, I'm not putting everything on, on the horsemen, but again, you know we. We were like into our third year mm -hmm. and obviously didn't have the, still enjoying great success, but, uh, you know, not the buzz that it was the yeah. year first and second year. The structure of the tour here is that you're doing like gimmick matches uh, in the main events on the tour. No heavyweight titles being defended until the final pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. So you're doing bull rope matches and war games Most matches and cage war matches. Games. and. Yeah night in and night out as the main events. Was that a problem for the guys? Did it take a larger toll to do those kind of matches on you? Uh, yes, but also uh, it still, it drew well, didn't have the overhead that the, that the big stadium shows had. And the first war games had actually been 
the year before in July, July 4th uh, in uh, the Omni in Atlanta. And that's the one where uh, I really did a, a number on my shoulder. Mm. Uh, incredibly violent. And so that seemed like a natural thing to be able to run with based on the success of the first war games with a series of war games matches where you could cha change the key players and free somebody for uh, a single match to complement it without taking away the impact of the war games mm -hmm. itself. It reminded me of all of these old buildings that are now closing and all these historic locations, you probably in every one of them. It's sad in a way. Yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, that's one thing about wrestling. Uh, every, every city, every size, pretty much uh, in North America, I think I've been to like 30, 32 different countries around the world. You get, you know, uh, Royal Albert Hall in London, Madison Square Garden, the old Philly Spectrum, the old Boston Garden. There's an old joke about the Boston Garden where uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, his iguana, remember he's carrying the iguana, got loose. And they say it grew to six feet eating rats in the old Boston <laughs> Garden. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, yeah, wrestling, uh, and, and especially back as a young guy, I'll, I'll tell you an old Boston Garden story. When I first started wrestling in Big Jim Duggan, they were like, well, you're gonna wrestle in Boston Garden. So I got my two friends from my uh, hometown, Glens Falls, my two high school buddies, and we, we drive over to Boston, and after we're going to go to Florida uh, for a little bit of a vacation. So we can't, you know, you, you can find the garden, but you can't find the back way in. So we're driving around, we're late as can be, we're driving around, we're driving around, finally we get into the back of the garden, and uh, we pull in, we open the trunk, I grab my bag, and I run in, and my friends are Neil McPhillips and John Kelly, two Irishmen, right? So Kelly's driving, and he, they go in. So I run in, and Arnie's uh, Scullin's running the show. He's like, Hacksaw, come on, get ready. You're on, you're on first. I'm like, oh, my God. I open my bag, and I pull my bag open. It's all my Florida stuff. It's no, my wrestling bag is still in the car. I'm like, oh, my God. So I run out, I grab the guy. I say, will you please page John Kelly? He says, we're in Boston. You page John Kelly. We have 200 people come down here, man. But long story short, I ended up finding Kelly and got my gear and was able to wrestle. They still talk about that up in Newfoundland. Yeah, I was just, uh, like I said, this past summer I was up there for two weeks and uh, yeah, they, they still talk about Adrian dying up there. And of course, uh, Junkyard Dog got killed in a, uh, a car accident. Yes. Uh, car accidents or, or you know, I've, I've had a few extremely bad ones over my career. Uh, spent a lot of time in a car. In the Mid-South uh, territory, we drive 2,500, 3,000 miles a week. Uh, so there was a, a, a lot of tragedy on the road. Did you uh, spend any time with Adrian? Uh, not too much, no. That again would have been a good party, Adrian and you. Jake? Well, well, maybe Morton? Jake, well, no. Morton, Piper. Morocco? Morocco. There's a hotel room. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be caught dead in. You should have seen my bachelor party. Actually, Jake put on my bachelor party for oh me. Oh, uh, Was it in hell? It was in Detroit, which is close. <laughs> Take a left at hell. <laughs> The commission up there made it clear first time blood would stop the match so okay. so that was legit oh yeah uh -huh. and so that was a way really to get out of the match and if everybody's really mad say well, why don't you call the commission office that is their rules right and so it was a way to have it happen have blood have Luger clearly in control, and it was out of Tommy Young's hand because I could see that he was clearly bleeding. I looked at the commissioner, and he said, no, it's over. It's over, not because Flair submitted, but because he's bleeding, and I stopped the match. So it wasn't a hard way. He did blade, but intentionally to get it stopped right at that point where he had Flair up. Yes. Is what I am to understand. And Luger was 
dreadfully fearful. Of bleeding? Yes. You can't even say the word, you're so old school, aren't you? I am. I love that. And it ended up, in order to get through it, I was the one that had to cut him. Oh, is that true? Yeah. In that match? Yep. I think it might be the only time in my career that I ever did that. Were you trepidatious about cutting someone else for fear that you... No, because uh, I was, I thought, very, very skilled. I mean, I probably have thousands, and if you look uh, at, at this stage of my life, I'm not horrifically scarred like some guys. I mean, you can see them if you look for it, but if you're not looking for it... What makes a proper, uh, a well-crafted gig? Just being good at what you do. Is and, there I, some... and I told Luger that I would take care of him. Mm -hmm. And he trusted me. And he's, you know, his worst fear, of the, because he was a narcissist, his worst fear was that, <laughs> that uh, somehow he was going to be scarred. Scarred for life. for life. And that I would, you know, have total disregard because it wasn't me, it was somebody else. And I took good care of him. And okay. he talked about his scar for a little bit after that, but I don't even it, He got over it. Is there a better product, is there a better blade to use than others? This could be a public service for young workers. Something that will leave mm. less of a scar that won't cut you too deeply, which may be more superficial wound. Uh, everybody had their own thing, and it wasn't, it was something for the most part that, it, and again, you say, well, yeah, you're so old school, you don't want to talk about it, yeah. It just was, uh, it was a personal thing, and, and guys that did because uh, it enhanced the, the performance, found ways to which they were comfortable with, and I was no different. Is there any kind of vortex effect in there? Is it like the return of Hogan? Do, do people feel they're not going to get the push maybe they hoped they would when he wasn't? Well, it's a very competitive business. You know, that's why folks go, well, you wrestlers, you're all good friends, aren't you? I said, yeah, we all compete for the same money. We're real good buddies. You know where the wrestler handshake goes, right, brother? Well, it's like this. And they say, yeah, 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 stab in the back, you know. And uh, so, sure, anytime somebody comes in, you know, you, and you know, think the card's going to, the deck's going to get reshuffled. And you know, it's, it's like war. You know, somebody gets shot, boom. Sorry it's you, but I'm glad it's not me, you know. And like, it gives me an opportunity, but it's the real world. And of course, Hogan comes in, everybody's going to take a bump down. Because Hulkster's Hulkster. You got the, you got the Rock, you got Triple H, you got Stone Cold, you got whoever. But Hulk Hogan's Hulk Hogan. We hear a lot about Hogan and, and his demeanor and how he's perceived by others. And how was his behavior at this time in the 80s? I mean, he was the deal. And yeah, I, I always got along with Hulkster. We never were close, but we always kind of got along because there's very few of us that have been around this long. And at this point, I think there's a mutual respect and stuff. But I think, yeah, Hogan kind of transcends wrestling. So uh, I admire the guy. I, I, I think he's taken the business to a whole different level. And now with TNA, I think that's going to open up a, a lot of opportunity, not only uh, for a lot of people, but hopefully for me also. When you were told, were you were told that it was an accident, uh, a fan, or were you told right from the get-go that the promoter had stabbed Brody? Yeah, the story came out that right away that it was uh, uh, the invader, Jose Gonzalez, that had stabbed him. And not a whole lot of details. Um, it just, it, uh, Puerto Rico was not a great place to work, to start with for me. Um, the fans over there used to take plastic cups, fill them with sand, urinate in them, and then use them as bombs. Uh, it just was a very, very difficult, dangerous, dangerous place to work. Um, it, it just was, you just don't believe things like that could happen. And obviously, um, and this is many years later, uh, I, I had a chance to be around Tony Atlas uh, within the last year. 
Scott Teal did my autobiography, also published uh, Tony's autobiography. And one of the chapters was devoted to speaking in great detail about that night because he was there yes. in the dressing room. He took was, the ambulance ride also. He was the first one, mm -hmm. when, when he heard the noise, went in there, uh, talks very openly about having seen the knife, saw the, saw the cuts. Uh, the things that really disturbs me to this day was I hear that an ambulance was called and then the ambulance was basically stalled outside. There was a, almost a deliberate delay to get medical help to, to him. Then Tony actually physically picked him up to put mm -hmm. him on the gurney and then they said, who's gonna go with him? And nobody, nobody volunteered. So he went with him yeah. in the ambulance to the hospital when he got there. I mean, you know, knife wounds in, in Puerto Rico apparently are very commonplace. And um, he, he finally said, you know, this, this man needs, needs help. The doctor saw and said he would go into immediate surgery. And so Tony left to go back to the arena, I think, as he was going in for surgery or the surgery had just started. Um, and Tony tells a story and, and probably at some point, if you haven't had this conversation already with Tony, you should. We did. Um, his thing is that he was later told that someone showed up and ordered the doctors to stop treating him in the midst of surgery and told the doctors to go somewhere else. And he died as a result of the fact that uh, it, it's almost like it's not almost like there was a conspiracy that somebody wanted him to die that night. Well, Brody had a huge impact on my career. Uh, like I said, he, I was with him and Buck Rowley when I became Hacksaw Jim Duggan. A lot of my ring mannerisms and uh, my persona kind of comes from Bruiser Brody. Not a clone of Brody, but just as I tell the young guys, you're going to have a, a break in the business. You're going to have a hundred different guys tell you stuff. Take some from this guy, take something from that guy. You know, take. But I was able to take a lot, a lot from Brody, and uh, he got uh, stabbed to death in Puerto Rico, and I have uh, never wrestled in Puerto Rico since then. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would never go to Puerto Rico. Have you ever run into Jose Gonzalez? Uh, no, not that I know of. Yeah. Tell you the truth, I wouldn't know who I saw him. That's the uh, pinnacle of my career. People say, what's the most memorable deal? Andre the Giant, Madison Square Garden. No matter what profession you're in, no matter, you know, what do you do? You sell out the garden, you sell out the garden. And if you're the main event and the bombs, you take the heat. The main event is the sellout, you take the gravy. And uh, we had a good house. And it, it was just, like I said, the pinnacle of my career to wrestle Andre at Madison Square Garden. Especially growing up 200 miles north in Glens Falls. The garden's still a garden. Mm -hmm. Kurt's a with God bless him, was a, a great friend of mine, you know, and I, I ribbed Kurt to, to this day. Because when I was in uh, uh, the hospital with my cancer, Kurt calls me, and he had to go through a whole lot to get through to me back then. Finally, he calls me in the hospital, and like, Kurt, you know, thank you so much. I know you went through a lot to, to call me. He says, uh, well, heck, can I catch this on the phone? <laughs> my cancer, I'm like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> That was Kurt. So you know what Kurt Hinton would do when he was alive right now? Get me out! <laughs> I oh, got a rib geez. about him, man. Kurt would be ribbing about me if I was dead. But Kurt was a, I tell you, Kurt Hinton <laughs> took the best bump of anybody I ever saw. We were in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis. Uh, the, it was the uh, North Stars hockey game, right? And uh, they had me as the baby face and Kurt as the heel. And so it, and 
the end of the first period, and they send me out and I'm waving and everybody, oh, USA, USA. And, you know, so the next break, you know, Kurt goes out there and he's sneering, they're, they're booing, they're booing. He steps off the walkway, whoop, 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 boom, takes a bump. The place went crazy. I mean, went crazy. He got up, tried to take another little face bump, and I said, the North Stars won, the pop was here. When Kurt took the bump, the pop was here. I mean, that was an ultimate professional. Kurt, uh, one of the few guys that really surprised me when he passed. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love Kurt. He was a good friend. mentioned this a little bit before, maybe as part of the beginning of the end <coughs> and expenditures and how can we not feel that the company's beginning to spread itself too thinly? We're scaling back on houses and talking maybe to Turner about coming in. Why move? I, I think it was part of the terms of the deal that Watts had a lease on this beautiful building and this beautiful office complex. And so part of the deal was buying the building and taking over the lease. It also fit nicely into Jimmy Crockett's master plan of at some point having to make that big step of, of moving away from of Charlotte if you're going to expand. And he talked about maybe doing movies. Uh, <coughs> that you, you, And so this was a decision the, and I had been told about it a year before. Jimmy had said, you're one of my key, key people, and so think about it. So I actually bought a house, because I had a friend that lived there, Kendo Nagasaki, who lived in Dallas and was working there, and I uh, had gone out to see him, saw where he lived. So I ended up buying a house from a developer that used it as his, um, model home model. Yeah. and bought that house because it had all the extra amenities and the builder then leased it back for me to continue to use it as a model because mm. I said I'm not going to move here for a year right so I was already set and so when the time came um, you know I went ahead and, and moved and actually then lived in that house for six months until things you know got really bad and um, that's when I got a phone call from Tully uh, shortly after they had left, months after they had left, saying, you know, that they were running three tours a night up there and everything's being done by Vince and Pat Patterson. They need help. Your name's been brought up, and I don't know, you know, your situation there or, or what, but uh, I think if you want to, uh, you know, they'd be glad to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. A, do we really need another Russian assassin? I don't think so. Got the answer to that. Um, Jack Victory brought in as the Russian assassin. You may want to comment on that. Don't even remember. Okay. And turning Ivan, we're still under the red curtain in 1988, right? We're not friends yet. What's, I mean, is it just because it worked well with Nikita that I think because Nikita had changed, and so that unit wasn't one, what it once was. And Ivan had been around a long time. And a lot of times, a guy who's a very successful heel is a heel for so long that in time, the fans just endear to him maybe more out of respect than anything else. So it might have been a thing you know, just, you know, moving Ivan over the other side. The accent was still the same. Everything he did was still the same. Uh, uh, and, and I don't remember B 
beyond that what the specific logic was to do it and do it then, other than the, the thing with he and Nikita obviously, right. uh, you know, was over and had its run. Um, again, maybe one of these guys that didn't fit the new image they were going for. And yeah, and it's hard to stick around. You know, I tell kids, you know, that you do a lot of autograph sessions, a lot of personal appearances, you meet a lot of folks, and they're like, well, Michael, what, he wants to be a professional wrestler. He's going to be a professional wrestler. I said, well, son, there's, you know, 1,500 NFL football players playing this year. There's 1,000 NBA basketball players. There's maybe 120 guys on contract with the WWE. It's television. It's more competitive than sports. Mm -hmm. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and it's very hard to get in, and it's very hard to stay for any length of time. There's many flash in the pans. Goldberg, Warrior. What a great wrestler. I said he was a great wrestler for 20 minutes. What the hell are you talking about? It's hard to stay popular and stay current in this business. And that's one of the things that I hang my hat on as much as Madison Square Garden. 31 years ago, I was entertaining people in 1979. And I, tonight, I'll have the folks standing up. And everybody in the place better be giving me a ho and a USA, brother. This is a goofy question, but do, I, do, well, you, still, do you still love it? <laughs> I do love it. Are you kidding? How can you charge not love out it? of it when you're out there? How can you not love it, brother? It's great, especially I know I'm at the twilight. I'm, I'm, I'm cheating time now. I'm 56 years old, so I know I don't have mu much more time left in the ring. So yeah, I, I, I'm enjoying every minute of it. You, you can't help it. Even on the smaller shows, which the smaller independent shows are more what professional wrestling really is about. The WWE is the monstrosity of entertainment and wrestling and the Corey Garf, uh, all kinds of stuff. But the independent show is what wrestling used to be, you know. I mean, uh, National Guard armies, high school gyms, and uh, and so at that level, it's fun to wrestle. And of course, at the WWE level or the TNA level, it's, it's it's fun to wrestle. Piper's Pits, the Brother Love shows, the Snake uh, Pits. How much of that is none of it scripted? Are you just told where you're going to go and you follow Pritchard, or how does that work? Yeah, if I remember correctly, I think that's just going to just follow the lead there and just, and just run with it. And I think that's it's, it's a learned trade also, is you learn your time in the ring and you learn how to do certain moves, whatever you want to call them, in the ring. You also learn how to do interviews and working for Mid South. These other territory organizations, you'd have to do an interview for every city that you're wrestling. You wouldn't do one generic interview. So you would learn how to do interviews. And I think the majority of the guys back then knew how to cut an interview and how to carry their own persona. And uh, now I, I think that's a lost art. And guys don't know really how to cut an interview. And that's why they have the, the verbiage and the, the writers. Jesse, I got along okay with Jesse, and of course, when he was the governor, everybody was, was blasting him. But I said, how many governors can you name today? Everybody knew who the governor of Minnesota was, Jesse Ventura, and he brought a lot of interest to the state. And I think even now he's politically active. Terry is one of the more talented guys in the business. He kept a journal for many years about finishes and angles and all that stuff. Always knew he'd probably be in the office it should have been. But Terry's probably one of the guys that puts his foot in his mouth more than anybody I've ever met. I mean, if he just learned to keep his mouth shut, he'd do so much better. But he would say things and he had a lot of heat with people. And I think that's part of the deal with the Red Rooster. 
because Terry is a GQ guy. He's like uh, Flair and uh, DiBiase. I mean, they'd be on the road for a month and they still got the crease in their pants. They're tasseled loafers. I mean, they're GQ kind of guys. So to make Terry Taylor a red rooster was probably one of the worst things you could do to the guy. Where, you know, if Terry, like I said, if he went with it and really just, you know, shaved his head and get the rooster deal and, and really embraced it, I think he would have done well with it. But he could tell, as me with a janitor, if they give you something like that, take it and run with it. Don't do it, oh shit, if this is what I gotta mm. do, cock a doodle do. No. Cock a doodle do, man, take it over the top. Mm. And it's a business, and that's what Terry should have done. What? Does opinion. it mean something, the Red Rooster? Is it just face value? They want him to walk around like a rooster? Or is there some history to the term Red Rooster that I don't know about in the business? Not that I'm aware of. I think it was just a deal where a guy like Terry Taylor, you know, who was the GQ kind of guy, was kind of a rib on him to be out there crowing like a rooster. <laughs>was it a good idea to turn them? To turn? Uh, Cornette and uh, Midnight Express. Oh, Again, man. iconic heel. Yeah. Uh, Does a babyface manager ever work, really? Not really. And, the, and I think I go back to what we said earlier about Mount Rushmore and, I, and that third spot I have up there is uh, with Jim Cornette. Uh, I regard him as a great friend and somebody that I have tremendous respect for professionally because of his passion for the business, his work ethic, and, and what, he, what he had accomplished. Um, I still to this day say that if I went to one of these uh, reunion shows and they said, well, tonight, you know, the, would, might, which might be the last time ever the Rock and Roll Express against the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette. I would make a point to be there and watch it. I mean, that's how much I loved watching them even mm -hmm. after all of these years. Uh, it, it just was uh, a magic with that, co with that combination. Now you get to work on the other side, so you and Cornette now are verbally yeah. sparring, mm -hmm. and that must have been at least it fun. Was, it was fun. And I, I think I wrestled Cornette one time in Philadelphia. I don't know if that was the same night. And I had a match with Cornette. And he, not that I was the picture of the classic wrestler, but I had wrestled a lot. He had wrestled none, and he had this whole body suit, and he had pads where muscles, <laughs> muscles were supposed to be. And I don't know, he hit me with powder, got some, some heat and ended up, uh, uh, I kicked him in the groin and then knocked him out. <laughs> sounds like, it sounds like a Luthez, uh, Harley No, I wouldn't quite call it that. <laughs> it, but it was a, a lot of fun. And actually, somebody in the audience had a cam and, and, and recorded the match and, and Jimmy put it on something and sent it to me, which I, I, I haven't looked at, but I'm glad that that thing is preserved somewhere. But what is, most memorable about that match is on that particular night, the WWF ran the Spectrum and we were in Convention Hall. Right, that was the night you were both in Philly, okay. And we outdrew them. And again, coming back to you asked this question earlier, it kind of was a pride factor, bragging rights that as big and as great as they were, that on a given night, we happened to be in the same town the same night, and on that night, more people wanted to come see what we had than what they had. Mm. And the fact that I wrestled Cornette on that same car. It's probably the reason. We, <laughs> ah, I don't want to go there. No, 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 no. And I don't want it to be presented in that way. But it's nice to say, uh, and as kind of as a, as a footnote, and that just happened to be the only time in my career that, that Cornette and I ever wrestled each other. Fair enough. While we're on this topic, explain the timeline of events as Arn and Tully decide to go. When are you told? When do they make the decision? Do they say to you, why don't you come? How does this all go down? And ultimately, when does the office find out? It was building for a while. They've been talking to somebody 
and and I was in an awkward position because I worked in the office. Mm -hmm. So they didn't confide in me, and and I'm glad that they didn't because it would have put me in a in a terrible position. It was actually better off me not knowing. And it just seemed to me that it was uh, very, very close to that event where they said, you know, well, you know, we're done after that. We're going to drop the belts and we're gone. And it had been building. It had had its run. And at that point, that was kind of like the final nail in the coffin, that, that no matter what happened, once Tully and Arn left, the horsemen, mm. you know, were, were, that was it. There was no way to replace them. There was no way to camouflage it. There was no way to, it, it was over. And I, you know, they, you know, a lot of frustrating thing happen, things happened. And, and again, there was a lot of people in the business that their ultimate goal was to someday get there. Mm -hmm. And for them to be able to go there and told that they were going to be managed by Bobby Heenan, God, if I'd have been one of them, I think I would have been just as excited. And I was happy for him. You didn't feel abandoned at all? No, 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 no. Absolutely, actually did not feel anything. No, I mean, they, they have their families to take care of. And we really, really, to this day, I regard Arn as a very special friend. I talk to him a couple times a year. And when I talk to him on the phone, it's a... Uh, a great conversation. We have so much respect for each other. And we talk about uh, his family and how his family is doing. And he talks about my family. And, and he's out there on a pretty tough grind and, and, and just has so much knowledge. And, uh, you know, this, you know, every conversation uh, ends the same and it probably sounds strange and you have to be in the business to understand it. But he says, I love you. And I, and I I love you too. I got along okay with Dino and Frenchie. Frenchie was an awful lot of fun as manager. He would, because Frenchie didn't look like a wrestler, you know. I mean, he looked like a, a businessman, and of course, we're all, we'd all be getting off the plane, and you know, he wouldn't think he was one of the group. And Frenchie is one of the greatest deals. That the bags would be going around the carousel, you know. And Frenchie would be like, oh, my bag, my bag, and he grabbed the bag, he'd be like, oh, 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 <laughs> he'd take a bump, and everybody would be like, oh, God, God help <laughs> I love Frenchie. And of course, uh, and, and Dino obviously had uh, some demons of his own going on to be murdered the way he was, but uh, in the ring, yeah, we, we got along well, and of course we did uh, the Sky Dome WrestleMania together, and uh, did good business with Dino. <laughs> Produced in Toronto. Yes. Did you do any of them? Yeah, I did an episode. Okay. One of the early episodes. How does this deal come to fruition uh, where the Crockett's would be supplying talent? I don't remember what the initial connection was, but it was, again, you know, you, you, you grow and you expand and you want to do other things. And the thought of supplying talent uh, f for this thing, uh, I went up there and I think it was like a four day. Thing and got to be around Lyle Alzado, a great guy who, you know, uh, he got very sick and, and died a horrible death, but it was great to be around him. And I, the one episode, I think I still have a copy of it somewhere, where uh, I was a wrestler who's, who uh, uh, moonlighted as an artist, you know, love, you know, and I don't remember how it all came out, but Lyle Alzado was a school teacher during the day. They wrestled with a mask, that was the premise. And, and then all of the, the stories involved that where uh, he didn't want anybody at the school to know that that's what he did. Did you feel a little bit of a betrayal? Because here is for the first time, certainly for you for the first time, you're participating in something which says, it ain't what you think it is. Even no. if we already knew? No, never no. thought of it that way. Okay. I mean, I had a dream career. If I could sit down and say all the things that I wanted to do and accomplish in the places that I wanted to go, uh, I really did it all because I was very lucky 
had a lot of help, right place at the right time. Uh, being on a, on a television show, even if it was one episode in the series, was a new mm -hmm. horizon for me. A lot of guys have been in movies, and I was never one of them. I remember the, a bunch of guys in Amarillo early in my career uh, worked in a movie, and they left me in Amarillo because I was working the main events at the time, and they couldn't afford to. So I was disappointed that I didn't get to be in that movie. Would like it someday to mm -hmm. be in a movie, some minor part. There's very few things that I haven't accomplished, but it's always nice to have like a, like was it a, would it be a bucket list or a wrestling? A I, don't have a, I don't have an action figure. Right. It's the only thing I, I don't have. And I would have thought, and, and at one point, um, wow. the WWF slash WWE had a thing with Jack's toys that yeah. I think is now expired, but um, nobody ever said so, but apparently uh, there had to be approval from Vince and I was not on the best of terms with him, so it never, it never got done. Uh, maybe, maybe because of that. And I've had people say, "Wow, I can't believe that they could have marketed a horseman set, but there isn't one of you." Uh, yeah, I would have thought it's a business decision. And so yeah, there's very few things that the I, Almighty Buck didn't yeah. even supersede uh, the personal like whatever. Like to be in a movie someday, and maybe before I before I go to the great beyond that uh, there, there may be a J.J. Dillon action figure. We'll see what we can do. Um, great power of this media. Oh, listen, I'll tell you. Hey, fake commentaries goes everywhere. Isolate that. Isolate that. Um, for the record, it was October 15th, your epic steel cage battle with, uh, with Cornette. Okay. That's what you were referencing yeah. before, right? Yeah. You went 9.08. Kick to the groin, forearm to the face, See? and exhausted yeah. and bloodied Dylan collapses on top of Cornette. That was it. Was this a rib on Dusty? A African Dusty? dream, white guy talks black. African dream, white guy acts black. I actually, I think, well, everybody's got their own take on it. Uh, my take is, uh, the way I understood it, is I think they wanted gang, uh, George, who's a good friend of mine, married to Mary Ellis, a friend of our, my family's for years, him and his wife been together for, very, uh, for a long time. But he wanted to take some time off. And as a one-man gang, he was a big, impressive, tough man. He really was. And uh, they were like, well, we got this deal going with Hogan, and you know, you're going to go with Hogan at the one-man gang. And he's like, I'm going back to Louisiana. You know, I want to go back on, I got this time. So he went back to Louisiana and came back, this is my take on it, yeah. came back and I think as kind of punishment they were like, well, okay, you're going to be a keen. And there, unlike Terry Taylor, who didn't embrace it, Gang embraced the keen and made it work and did business with it. Was it? Uh, I thought it was a roll of quarters. No, but I'll give you my again. Every, it's like you ask an eyewitness. If you ask everybody in this room, we'd all tell a different story. Go right ahead. That's why you're my, here. My take on the story. Again, the Bulldogs would pick their spots. Mm -hmm. They picked on Jacques Rougeau. Jacques was playing cards. Um, I think it was Dynamite came in, hit him in the back of the head, screwed him around, you know. Jock wasn't going to make a comeback there. He did his ass beat. So, down the road, he messed with me, he messed with my brother, right? Suppose we, the Dynamite's walking by with two coffees. I don't know about roll quarters, but boom, and worked them over. I thought that he had to come and tell you the truth. Were you there? I was in the building, but I missed all the action. Yeah, because it happened, it was, you know, as, as most real action deals do, they happen in seconds, it's all over. But, uh, yeah, I, th I thought he had it coming. A lot of people probably did. Um, while we are there, talk to me about the, what the Bulldogs were like when they were in the building with you. Were you somebody that they messed with, or were you no, one of the ones they that you said were? No, they wouldn't mess with me. No, they wouldn't mess with me. 
It's the advantage of carrying a two by four. <laughs> That's what Brody told me years ago. He says, forget the sequin robes and the feathered boas. He said, carry something you can use. <laughs> Which back in the old days came in handy over the years. But uh, yeah, they, they, they didn't, I'll back Jack, they ran him out of the territory. Tully I, I met back in the old days when I worked for Joe Blanchard uh, in San Antonio. And uh, of course, Tully changed his life as a lot of guys have uh, done this reborn deal. Tully, Sean, uh, Steve Williams, Diviasi, Jake, even Jake was doing the reborn deal for a while. I saw Jake, I said, Jake, I just saw you on Christian Broadcast Network. I mean, how in the world do you do it? He says, oh, it's great, Hexel. I sell my 8 by 10s <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Magic. But I think now, now Teddy, on the other hand, <laughs> Teddy actually changed his life. DiBiase. Yeah. DiBiase is a uh, is truly changed his life. As uh, many guys were addicted to different things, Teddy really enjoyed women, mm -hmm. and uh, he he turned his life around. And him and Mel, who was also a very good friend of mine, uh, got through that rough time and, and made it. And now, of course, his, his boys are doing great. Right. And that was uh, my, my big break at uh, Mid-South. I came in from San Antonio into Mid-South and then uh, Vince started running the Wrestlemania series and when uh, Dog was the first one to jump ship and come up to uh, WWE or WWF back then and of course when Dog left I went from the second bay, I went to the top babyface spot. So that really opened up the door for me. And then WrestleMania 2, uh, Jake came up for WrestleMania 2. And then they were coming into WrestleMania 3. And, and Watts, of course, wanted to keep me there. And he paid me well. Bill screwed a lot of people, no question about it. He was a, a vicious man back in the day. Mm -hmm. He changed his life. I mean, he would have, uh, like, some young guy would want to get into business. He'd have me or Doc or some other amateur get out there and roll around with a kid for 10, 15 minutes and blow him up. And then Bill would get in there and stick him in a yeah. sugar or something and, and hurt the guy. He was a, a, a mean, a mean person. But he treated me, he treated me well. He liked me, he liked Dog, he liked Steve Williams, he liked the jocks, you know, the guys that came out of the athletics. But uh, when, so when Dog came up, and bumped me up and then uh, Snake, came up for the uh, second one and Jake called me and says, you need to get up here because things were really cooking. Mm -hmm. You know, they just started the action figures. People say, Hexo, I got your doll. I said, they're not dolls, they're action figures, brother. <laughs> of course, it was always hard. I'd be picking up after my daughters and have a couple Barbies over. Oh, hi, Hexo. <laughs> you have actual dolls in the house? Uh, action figures, brother. Action figures yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> offers right away to move? No, not right away. I think uh, once H Hogan went down there, that's when, I, yeah, I think Turner had it before Hulkster went. And I was in, um, I was living in uh, Florida at the time, and uh, the, one of Hogan's first appearances, his first or second appearance on uh, with uh, Turner, uh, Hulkster called me and I went over and made the appearance. had to read that three times to make sure that was true, but it is. Is yeah. this a case of never needed a strap, so why give them one? They were over without it? Or was there a reliability problem? Why didn't the Road Warriors ever hold a tag title? Good question, and I think you've probably answered it. It's like, you get asked the same question, why was Andre the Giant never the world champion? Right. Well, because he drew money and didn't need it. And then the other part of it is, once you put it on him, how do you get it off? Right. The Hogan problem, yeah.
Was it now known by all of the employees that this was it? I, I think we knew before it was finalized, yes. Was, there had been a due diligence thing where they sent representatives to talk to all key people, and, and I, they talked to me too, and, and probably talked to most, if not all, of the talent. And I think they wanted a, 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 an independent feel that they could go back and report that this is a, a, a good thing to follow through from based on all, all of our research. So we thought it was a good deal because they, in the conversations at least that I had, it was like all of a sudden you're going with a company that has tremendous resources to go through good times, bad times. We are a broadcast company, so we have access to equipment, to studios, to remote trucks, to, I mean, you know, we can take all of that to a, a new level. The other big thing that we have is that we're already established worldwide. So we now could take the programming and package it with other things to, and go to places that, that you've never been. Everything sounded like a, a, a just a no-brainer mm. reason why every everything would was going to improve what situation was uh, as it existed at that point. One of the interesting comments during those discussions, at least as it pertained to me, was the comment was made, well, the, and they went down that list of all the things that they could, could bring to the product to make the product better. There was always the added thing, well, we're not going to touch the core product because it's obvious that, that you people know your product and, and know how to run it. So we're not going to interfere with that. And it just was kind of thrown in there. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. Well, the ink wasn't even dry on the contract. And the reality of what happened was that a lot of closet wrestling fans that were in positions of upper management all of a sudden now had a voice of what it was going to take to suddenly make things better in terms of ratings. And it became apparent that, okay, here is a broadcast company who, who never ran a wrestling company. It's a unique product that is very simplistic in terms of what it is. It's a unique athletic product, good versus evil. Uh, but there was always that balance between, as we had talked earlier, about what you put on television and what you save because I came from the, the, the old school that your, that your live events and then pay-per-view, which was basically another live event with, with, with much, much greater seating capacity, mm -hmm. was where your, your, your income, that's where you made your money. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a, a broadcast company that really doesn't fully understand that. They look strictly at ratings. Well, bigger ratings, more eyeballs, will turn into a more successful product. So, you know, there was a guy, in, and I don't even know if he's still there, his name is Jeff Carr, and he was outspoken. He said, well, I don't know why this is uh, so complicated. You put Flair and Sting on TV, next week in a TV match, the ratings will go through the roof. Hmm. Maybe the week after that. <laughs> All right, you've done en enough here that you understand the business, obviously more than Mr. Carr did, mm. because yes, uh, you would, but in the mind of creative, it wasn't just next week's show. You're already thinking the week after, the week after. And you reach a point where, okay, I got a huge bump in ratings. Now what do I do next week? Well, I give them a return match. What do I do again? Give them a return now? Where am I going to go? And so they never really understood that because they didn't have to to stay in business. They had other things. Here, here, I answer, and then they went off doing doing whatever that they were doing. You're in the office at this time. So prior to this, when it was the Crockett's, it, Dusty would have an idea and maybe run it by Jim Crockett, and they'd mm -hmm. hash it out, and Dusty would go to the locker room that night, and that would be it. Now. 
who's in the building talking to Dusty about what he's going to do? Who is that person who's going to make the call? I don't know that that happened in that way. I, I think what happened was Dusty was made the scapegoat. In other words, things got bad. We've heard all of this criticism. Dusty's uh, lost his handle on it. He's burned out, whatever mm -hmm. they wanted to come with. And so it was one of the conditions was, well, he's got to go. We get, get somebody else. And that was very unfair to Dusty. And at one point they announced that Dusty was being, was being replaced. By and, and, I, I, and they were going to bring in a strong leader. And I don't know who was going to be the, the, uh, the strong leader was Jim Hurd. And I remember being in Norfolk and Jim Hurd right before the show began, which I think was a clash in Norfolk. Jim Hurd came in with his wife on his arm and Lou Thez, who lived there, who was a legend and, and so highly respected. And Jim Hurd had been a program director or something in St. Louis at one time, which was where, um, you know, Thez, with a connection to the NWA, had been, they had been friends. Mm -hmm. And so Jim Hurd brought Lou down to the matches with Lou's wife. And uh, it was only like the third time I think I'd seen Lou Thez. And he just, Jim Hurd came in with a very uh, arrogant air about him. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my God. And I'm, this is me talking to myself thinking, boy, I don't like what I'm seeing. And what had happened was uh, I'd had a contract. The contract expired and I just was there working and nobody with everything else that was going on had paid a lot of attention to, to, the, to the fact that my contract had expired. Jim Barnett, who was working there, and Jim, was, my boy, we have to get together and we need, we need to get a contract done for you. Ah, Jim, we'll get around to it. And then when I had gotten the call from Tully and knew that Vince wanted to talk to me, I wanted to keep all of my options open. Yeah. So I just was so busy that it just something that, that, that didn't get addressed. Yeah. And then when I finally met with Vince and got the job offer, uh, which was um, in mid-December of 1988, and a couple of days later made my decision and knew that I was leaving, um, and started up there the first week, I think February of 89. Now, the blood on television results in 300 or so calls to TBS. Is it now a bigger problem because you're under the watchful eye of the new Papa? Uh, does, this, does this create a problem? Oh, I'm sure it did, without specifically remembering right. who said what to who. Absolutely. And probably uh, would have lit the fire under Dusty Rhodes if it wasn't already there for, again, uh, another reason to, to, for him to be the scapegoat. You guys forced to do any promotion for the boxing? Not too much for the boxing, but the bodybuilding. Remember the WBF, yeah. World Bodybuilding Federation? And again, I'll Kurt Hinning's story. We're down in uh, Florida somewhere, and they're going to do a big tug of war with the bodybuilders, right? Of course, we're at some beach, and it's all, you know, all sand in the water and everything. The bodybuilders are getting all the oil. They're all greased up. They're looking great, you know. And, so we all get a hold of rope, and so Kurt goes on three, let go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one, two, and three. Boom, we let go of the body ball. I'll take a bump in the sand. They're covered in oil, so they get up there all sandy. But uh, we kind of resented the uh, bodybuilders because the WWF was hot. We were generating income for the company, and the, uh, he offered contracts to the bodybuilding people. 
and they weren't bringing in no, no money to the company, and they were making more money than a lot of the rest. It didn't last long, though, anyway. It didn't it last long, no. Right, I think I had my team was a four by fours, maybe. Oh, okay, yeah, it could be. I, I think yeah, I had a team there. But, um, yeah, we're just, again, just part, glad to be part of the, uh, the big package. Were those uh, pay-per-views as much money as the WrestleMania from a payday standpoint? No, WrestleMania, of course, is the, the uh, marquee thing of the, uh, the company, so it's the, the biggest payoff. You know, it's funny because I, I did glance at your notes prior to uh, you, some of these questions. I should have. And <laughs> <laughs> I did say that. Uh, but I'm contemplating writing a follow-up book, and I looked through my uh, ledgers, and I took some notes. And my final sanctioned wrestling match was in Albuquerque. In, in that tag. I had forgotten that Flair was scheduled to be there and I took his place that night. But I thought it was so unusual that uh, I think it was Barry and I mm -hmm. against Bam Bam Megalo and Eddie Gilbert, both of which were great success stories in our business, both of which were no longer with us. And for a career that expanded 20 some years as a wrestler, quote, manager, and over 3,100 and some actual wrestling matches, it was the only time I was ever in the ring to face Bam Bam Bigelow, the only time I was ever in the ring to face Eddie Gilbert. And it was really the final match of my career before. I, I was in a couple of battle royals uh, the end of the month and the first month of January, but that was my final match mm. before I basically retired and uh, went to work in the front offices for what was then the, the WWF. And I had n not thought about the circumstances and didn't realize that it was originally advertised as Flair. So that particular night, uh, the story has kind of built up more in hindsight, really actually looking at your notes of, of the specifics of mm -hmm. the situation and how I got there. Do you remember why Flair was bumped, did you say? Or no. No. Okay. no. Well, you are gone in mid-December, right? I, think uh, I didn't. Year, right? I I didn't finish until uh, about the, I think the second week in January, third week in oh, January. Okay. It was a battle royal in Kansas City, and that was my uh, my swan song. And uh, I had some minor surgery done after that, and then started uh, I think February eighth uh, in Stanford. So the year of 1988 is an actual, actually an, an interesting encapsulation of not just your tenure there, but we've seen the transition of, of the horsemen and for the, the era that we remember as the horsemen uh, come to conclusion. Your tenure with the Crockett's, which was for, you know, how many years? Five there? years. I five there. years. Yeah. And Over the, five years. You know, really for, for that peak time of their promotion it was a big year. It was a huge year, and I think I mentioned to you uh, when we spoke uh, privately last night, I, I, I didn't save a whole lot of uh, memorabilia from my career, but one thing that I do have uh, on the wall is uh, the cover from Pro Wrestling Illustrated dated December 1988, which would have had to come out probably months and months before mm -hmm. that. And it's a picture of the horseman on the cover and I, did, I had a jacket on as, as if I was wrestling that night, say a War Games thing, with Barry in the back and the headline at the bottom was, uh, um, you know, the, something about the, uh, the revolving door of the horseman, who's next? And I look at that and everybody assigned it. I have it framed and I thought, wow, that uh, that's when it was really at its absolute best and was a phenomenal run, and, and things just went crazy after that. And, you know, when I moved on, and because I started late in, in, in life, I was almost 29 years old when I started full, ni full time. So now I'm, uh, at that point, uh, 
I'm in my 40s. Uh, yeah, I was born in 42, can't do the math. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, I couldn't continue even on the level of entertaining matches, whether it was Cornet or, or, or Paul Ellering or whatever, or being in the war games. I mean, I, I still could, could not, not get in and, and not embarrass myself. But I, I knew that I couldn't do it forever. Sure. So that the timing was perfect for me to say, okay, this is it, I'm walking away. And, and strictly being a front office position. And again, here I am now going to the place where everybody want, wanted to be and they've recruited, recruited me in essence. Uh, that I had started as a referee in college with Vince Senior, knew him, he was a wonderful gentleman that was kind to me when I was a nobody. And now I've been all over the world, had this fabulous career and now his son has built this empire and I'm being recruited to come work side by side with him. I mean, it, it looked like uh, a, a perfect story. Yes. So thank you for the trip down memory lane. We appreciate it. Thank you for your first book, which is Wrestlers Are Like Seagulls, uh, available anywhere, I take it? And um, you have to go to my website, jjdillon.com or Crowbar Press. Okay. And, uh, jjdillon.com, crowbar press, bring it up on the screen there. And we hope you do a second one. You just teased that. Yeah, you I, have to. I, I'm, baseball season's winding down, and I have a, uh, through the winter months, uh, it will give me an opportunity to go, and uh, I've done a lot of research, and uh, it, it should be fun, and I think it'll be interesting reading just because as, a, as an in-ring performer, I have been in the ring with so, so many of the legends that I think that's a story in and of itself. It's an exclusive. Those kind of guys, the enhancement guys, the guys you respected and... Sure. Well, those are guys who make everybody else possible. I mean, you know, the guys with the big egos, uh, Sean and uh, Warrior and those people, the, the guys that do the jobs are the ones that enable you to, to be who you are. But I, again, I think uh, back then it was such a more closed society that the uh, job type talent would stick around much longer. I think now WWE, that's the deal. They always shuffle the deck. Guys come and go. I don't think you'll see a whole lot of 30-year career guys for many reasons. One, that the kids are making so much money now that you know they don't need to stay in 30 years. And plus, it'd be hard to, to appeal to folks for that long. Mm -hmm. And also on the independent circuit, as I was talking to a lot of folks, the, uh, the talent, the guys from the, the golden age of wrestling, the 80s and the early 90s, that are doing a lot of these independent shows, that's going to dry up because the top kids now in the business uh, will not be doing these independents. Right. Yeah, they're making enough money that once they're out of the business, they're out of the business. John and I were tag team partners for quite a while. It was me and John against Andre and Haku. And uh, Andre didn't like Big John. And John was weary of Big Andre. And there was a whole lot of friction there, which I was on the outside looking at me and Haku, even though Haku was a legit tough guy. And, uh, you know, we would stand back and watch that deal. And Andre was very abrupt with John, but John never made a stand with Andre. Mm -hmm. Well, you finished the year on December 30th in Madison Square Garden, fittingly enough, uh, pinning Dino Bravo in the, in the blow off of your flag match feud. Um, 1988, quite a year. I, uh, I will give you the regular non 
kayfabe handshake. No, no, thank you, brother. And thank you very much. Well, for my pleasure, man. Uh, uh, nice to go back and uh, remember those times and remember some of the guys. And, uh, like I said, a, a lot of guys are, are bitter about the business. A lot of people like to think of all the negatives that happen in this business. But like I said, there's a lot of guys, Bob Backlund, Tino Santana, and myself, Piper. We lived a uh, regular, normal life, and the business has been been great to me. I have, uh, I'm not bitter. I realize when I'm going in that sooner or later they're going to say that's enough of you. You're out of here. But uh, I had a great time. I was able to travel the whole world. I've been to every state in the union, every province in Canada. Like I said, 30, 30 something, 35 countries. Uh, it's been a great ride. And, I'm going to hold on to it all the way. People say, how much longer, Hex? So when they stomp on my fingers, I'm like this, and they're stomping on it, but uh, not yet, man. Well, continued success, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. One more hole before we go, brother. Come on, kid. Ho! Oh, hang on, tough guy! Thank you.